I would like to call the Prince William County School Board meeting to order. Um, just for anybody who may be watching, this is our first time to hold an official meeting once the governor has lifted the closure of schools at the end of June. So our first official meeting. We did have a meeting last week, which is a work session, but this is a first official board meeting. And so this is the first time we are able to enter the building and we are excited to be back. Next, um, the purpose of the meeting. The meeting of the Prince William County School Board is being conducted electronically, partially, and partially live. Under the authority granted by the General Assembly on April 22, 2020, through the Amendment 28 to House Bill 29, which permits the school board to meet electronically during the pendency, pendency of the current state of emergency for the purpose of transacting such business as is statutorily required or necessary to continue operations of the Prince William County Public Schools and the discharge of its lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities. The agenda this evening is limited to the proposed return to learning, return to work, and health plans related to the reopening of the Prince William County Public Schools. A motion is in order for the appro approval of the closed session agenda. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? Ms. Zargapur seconds. Any discussion? As seeing there's no discussion, please vote. I will do a roll call for those folks at home. Miss Jesse, how do you vote? Yes. Miss Jesse votes yes. Miss Jackson, how do you vote? Yes. Miss Jackson votes yes. Miss Ralston, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Ralston votes yes. So that's three at home voting yes. So the vote is eight yes, motion passed. The motion is eight yes, the motion is passed. And the motion is in order to enter closed session. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711, the Prince William County School Board enter closed sessions for the following reasons. One, to consult with division counsel and staff regarding specific personnel and student legal matters and threatened or impending litigation under VA Code 2.2-3711A1, 2, 7, and 8. And two, to consult with division counsel and staff regarding specific legal matters relating to the reopening of school and return to work of PWCS employees, which matters require provision of legal advice under VA Code 2.23711A8 and 19. Do I have a second? Ms. Wall seconds the motion. Any discussion? As seeing no discussion, please vote. Ms. Jesse, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Jesse votes yes. Ms. Jackson, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Jackson votes yes. Ms. Ralston? Yes. Ms. Ralston votes yes. Jesse, Jackson, Ralston all vote yes. The vote is eight yes, motion passed. The vote is eight yes, motion passes. At this time, the Prince William County School Board will enter closed session and return at approximately seven o'clock. The Prince William County School Board is now returning to open session from closed session. Before we go to our number of votes on closed session certification, some housekeeping. This is the very first time we're doing a hybrid meeting for this school board. We have reached maximum capacity for those of you watching on our webinar. Those at home, it may work better and we would ask you to consider if you have the option to watch on channel 18 Comcast or 36 Verizon or go to PWCS TV Dot com. The webinar has reached maximum capacity and it might be more efficient if you choose to go to, again, Channel 18 Comcast, 36 Verizon, or PWCSTV.com. This may be one of our highest rated meetings. Next, um, a second bit of housekeeping. This is the very first meeting the Prince William County School Board will have formally as a formal board since the governor lifted the order to return to school buildings. We had a work session last week which was done by Zoom, 
but this is our first in-person meeting here because we are allowed to now enter our facilities. Moving on to the closed session certification, a motion is in order. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, closed session certification. I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3712, the closed session of the Prince William County School Board meeting of July 15, 2020, be certified by adopting the following resolution. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Prince William County School Board hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempt from open meeting requirements were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard and or discussed or considered by the school board. Do I have a second? Ms. Zargapur seconds the motion. Any discussion? Without seeing discussion, please vote. I will call the roll call for those members at home. And, and let me, um, uh, I'll do the roll call and then I'll introduce our members by home. My apologies. Miss uh, Lily Jesse, how do you vote? Yes. Miss Jesse votes yes on the closed session certification. Miss Jackson, how do you vote? Yes. Miss Jackson votes yes. Miss Ralston, how do you vote? Unmute. Hit the space bar. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes. And Ms. Ralston votes yes. So um, tonight, this evening, we've also tried to do our meeting socially distanced, et cetera. Um, we have a number of members who are appearing by Zoom. We have Ms. Adele Jackson in the Brentsville District, Ms. Diane Ralston from the Neabsco District, Ms. Lily Jesse from the Occoquan District attending from home. And we have our other board members, Ms. Lori Williams, Vice Chair from the Woodbridge District, to my right. Next to her is Lisa Zargapur of the Coles District. And to my left, we have Ms. Jennifer Wall of the Gainesville District and Mr. Justin Wilk of the Potomac District. And Ben Kim, our student representative from uh, Rising Senior at Unity Reed High School. Next, we will, um, that motion passes, um, I assume, B? No, the motion passes 8-0. Um, I would like, to, uh, so I guess, okay. I would like to call the Prince William County meeting to order, right? We gotta do this again. Um, the meeting of the Prince William County School Board is being conducted electronically under the authority granted by the Virginia Code 2.23708.2A3 and the authority granted by the General Assembly on April 22nd, 2020 through Amendment 28 to House Bill 29, which permits the school board to meet electronically during the pendency of the current state of emergency for the purpose of transacting such business as statutorily required or necessary to continue the operations of the Prince William County Public Schools and the discharge of its lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities. The agenda of this evening is limited to the purposed return to learning, return to work, and health plans related to the reopening of the Prince William County Public Schools. Next, we will have our Pledge of Allegiance. I'll ask Ms. Argapur, or Mr. Kim, please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll ask board members, uh, remind them, and our staff who will be speaking, and citizen comment times, to please speak in the mic. It makes it easier for those listening at home to hear. Um, moving on to the approval of the public meeting agenda. Ms. Williams, a motion is in order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? Ms. Zargapur seconds. Second. And any discussion? Okay, no further discussion. Please vote. Miss Jesse, how do you vote? Yes. Yes? Yes. Miss Jesse votes yes. Miss Ralston, how do you vote? Yes. Miss Ralston votes yes. Miss Jackson, how do you vote? Yes. 
Yes, there's three yeses there, and uh, that the motion passes uh, unanimously. <clears throat> Citizen comment time. Due to the COVID-19 state of emergency and legal restrictions on school board's authority to conduct its meetings through electronic means, unlike other public bodies meeting electronically under more expansive legal authority, all discussions at this meeting by board members, staff, and citizens must be limited to agenda items. Citizens may speak on agenda item for two minutes. When the board is able to resume regular meetings without the virtual participation permitted during the state of emergency, expanded citizen comments will be resumed as provided by policy 134. In the interim, citizen comment time has been reinstated on a limited basis in order to allow public comment both in person and through electronic means during the state of emergency. Citizens are encouraged to submit their comments by email to the clerk who will share them with the school board. Those citizens who have signed up in advance with the school board clerk via email no later than 5 p.m. Wednesday, July 15, 2020 may address the school board in person or virtually on agenda items. We will begin by calling on those citizens who have signed up to speak in person, followed by those who signed up to participate virtually. Um, I'm going to ask Billy Sims to come to the mic first. Yeah, sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, let me do a couple other housekeeping announcements. You can come up to the mic, though. Please come up to the mic. Um, and I, I think it's important to say this, and, and I take a little bit of chairman's privilege here. Um, this meeting is taking place in the most unprecedented time in the history of our country. Over the course of the foreseeable next few weeks and months, we will have the responsibility to make decisions that will impact every single citizen in Prince William County. There has been obvious and enormous interest and concern about how we reopen. Emotions are very high and not surprising in the midst of a pandemic. Whatever this board decides tonight will make not everyone happy. There are many views on how we reopen, and every single board member here has worked extraordinarily hard to hear from their constituents, read their emails, follow the press, social media. I will emphasize that the success of whatever we decide will require everyone's efforts to pitch in together. We only will get through this together. And so I ask that um, everyone understand that as we move through this evening and the next few months. Miss Billy Sims. Do I start it? Yeah, yeah, just start it at two minutes, Jason. Fine, I'll give you, you'll have the three seconds extra. Don't worry, we'll let you go, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, uh, first I'd like to thank B. Simpson for ensuring I could speak this evening. Um, after I followed the proper procedures for the last virtual school board go-to meeting, receiving confirmation and listening for three hours and nine min minutes, my voice was still not heard. If adults cannot ensure their voices are heard, how do we expect our children to be able to do so? This is the microcosm of what our children will endure. My name is Billy Dunham. My husband Jason and I are here to advocate on behalf of our children for Prince William County to allow for in-person education. We have formed our opinion through the lens of the CDC, demonstrating that children are low risk at getting and are spreading the virus to their classmates and teachers in the Academy of Pediatrics guidance, stating children should return to school buildings. We have four school-aged children across three schools from elementary, middle, to high school. Last spring, our kindergartner had a once a week Zoom call during one of my weekly Microsoft Teams meetings. I would stress over ensuring she was on her Zoom meeting as I was trying to dial into my Teams meeting. After the stress of getting her on, and then she would fall asleep while she was watching her teacher read, and I had to excuse myself from work, mute my webcam, mute my microphone, nudge her to pay attention to a story. This is not education. In addition, I have a rising to my first grader, I have a rising sixth grader, freshman, and junior. A rising sixth grader is not on the same math le level as her siblings were when they entered middle school. She's at a deficit further exacerbated by the lack of teaching for a quarter of her pivotal fifth grade year. My freshman has an IEP for ADHD. She has issues in paying attention, managing papers, managing anxiety, being available for learning. Her IEP calls for co-taught in-person instruction, allowing for multiple prompts and supports to stay on task. This past school year, she was unable to complete it without us hiring a tutor for $50 an hour. That's not sustainable. My rising junior was told by his pre-AP teacher to look at 
up how to understand something on sciencegeek.net instead of offering him help. He tried on several occasions to communicate a project I would deal with her via email and was unsuccessful. That was his 1B keeping him from getting a 4.0. That's unacceptable. He also participates in school sports. He's currently talking to coaches from schools with strong academic institutions. Not only will he not be prepared for these schools academically, he won't be able to perform athletically. When he was 12, he battled depression after losing one of his best friends from childhood cancer. It took over a year for him to come out of that, only through sports and activity. We have the resources at home. We are a two-parent family, and, I, and virtual school failed our children. I can't imagine what it will do for the, the have-nots. Thank you. Thank you. Aisha Bostic. Aisha Bostic. Kate, Ol Kate Olson Flynn. Good evening, school board and Dr. Waltz. Please talk into the mic. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> if you raise it up a little bit, maybe. Or um, I would first like to thank you for all your hard work during this pandemic. I came here to, with a very prof professorial speech to address your choices of school reopening plans. And I realized that it was a waste of time to pontificate these issues, as you probably know all the problems that each plan has from the thousands of emails and questions you've received from teachers and the public. So I decided to share my own experience. George Mason came to me this summer asking me to choose the way I want to teach my two classes this fall in their education program. Despite my knowledge of the research on the benefits of teaching in person, the choice I made was easy. I opted to teach online in the fall. And not because I like it or because it's the best way to educate our future teachers, but because it's the safest choice for my family. I also felt okay with my choice because one, I know it's a temporary decision while we have this health emergency, and two, I've had training in how to best deliver my online class with Zoom lessons, breakout rooms, and Google Slides. My students will be as engaged as possible with me live on Zoom before I send them to do any asynchronous work. If I choose to teach online for my personal safety, how can I ask my children's teachers to not decide the same thing? So I put myself in their shoes. As we all know, teaching isn't just about sitting in a classroom delivering content to students. It's about the management of entrances, buses, exit, offices, hallways, bathrooms, cafeterias, outdoor, recess, movement from one place to the next, indoors, that teachers must negotiate daily. To say the virus exposure will not be great with 700 students because we put masks on and sit three feet apart is forgetting how schools run and how kids of all ages behave when they're with their friends. So in the end, if you choose the hybrid plan, please make sure that you have lots of teachers from all over the county, particularly in Title I schools, participate in planning committees so that all the contingency plans, procedures, and guidelines are based in the reality of how to manage schools and will be outlined before any school opens its doors to the public. I thank you for your time, and I ask that you please consider what the best plan is, not for yourself, but for your community that includes teachers, students, who are your colleagues, neighbors, and friends. Thank you. Magali Hurtado. Good afternoon. Thank you for your hard work. You know, before getting all the information we got during last work session, I advocated for the hybrid model, partial in person and partial online instruction. I genuinely wanted it to work because of the benefits it could represent for the many families uh, in our district and for many children. But I come to realize that we do not have the resources and the space to offer safe in-person option and equitable version, virtual instruction. Um, when looking at the potential schedules, it was clear to me that the in-person options take so much away from having a robust virtual alternative. I so desperately wanted my son to be able to interact with his teachers and friends that I convinced myself, let's put on a mask and voila, instant safety. But it's not like that. When I showed him a picture of how a classroom would look with the 50% option, he looked at me like I had two heads. The smile disappeared from his eyes. And um, I realized he can't learn that way, that way, and teachers can't focus on teaching if they have to monitor safety at all time. If our community safety needs are not met, we won't be able to fulfill our children's educational and self-actualization needs. I said kids need to be in school because their emotional health is important. It really is. But we cannot meet those needs if teachers, staff, and students are unsafe. 
three Arizona teachers were teaching a virtual summer class. They were the only people in the room. They were masked, they disinfected, they cleaned, and one of them died from COVID, that, and the three of them got it. How am I going to be able to look at my son in the eyes and tell him that his beloved custodian, God forbid, got COVID and passed away? What is that gonna do for their emotional health? We do not always have to follow Fairfax and Loudon. This time, we owe it to our community to set an example. We owe it to our community to lead. Please look at the counties across the nation that are making very hard but responsible choices. We need a transitional virtual plan. Thank you. Oveta Scott. Go ahead and start. Sure. Okay. They'll start the timer when you start. Okay. Good evening, Chairman Latif, ladies and gentlemen of the board, Superintendent Dr. Waltz. My name is Oveta Scott. I've been an employee in our school system for 15 years. First, I would like to address the statement that was made last week that teachers needed to be team players. Let me say that every teacher in Prince William County has been a team player since we entered this profession. <clears throat> we buy our own supplies, work above and beyond our contract time, and when the budget is tight, we go years without a raise. So if I need to be a team player with my life, are you, my coaches, going to come out the dugout and be with me? Are you going to equip me with what I need to help me stay in the game? Second, I am disappointed in the presentation last week on the return to work plan. The plan presented more questions than it did answers. The focus was so high on the instructional piece with explaining Canvas, but it failed, in my opinion, to clearly emphasize the safety measures and precautions that would be implemented in all the school buildings. Will every HVAC system be inspected and brought to code? Will all students' restrooms have working soap dispensers to ensure hand washing? where every building office have plexiglass, like here in the hill. Lastly, I'm going to end with a story, the tale of how COVID would come to our schools. Teachers and students will be partaking in a typical school day, but it'll be different because COVID will come to play. COVID knows no boundaries. It will not keep at bay, because once COVID entered the building, it will stay. Neither fire drill, secure in place, or lockdown will work, to help safeguard us because COVID is the worst. Once inside our offices, our classes, and our restroom, COVID will prey on our students and staff whom thought it was safe to resume. At the end of the day, as we return home to our families and friends, not knowing that COVID may come to and bring it to an end. So, I, so when COVID comes to our school, I guess we will just have to pray that death will not come the next day. Thank you. Sandra Kern. Good evening, my name is Sandra Kern. My address is on file, thank you for allowing me to speak. I am a parent of a high school special education student in Prince William County. I have a few points to share. Students aren't prepared 100% virtual or 50% distant learning. The infrastructure to provide quality equity is not in place and the plans has holes and they need to be filled. There's nothing solid. Parents need to update their internet now obtain the equipment, the computers. We are participating in summer school program. We've learned the huge gaps in two weeks. We need to seal those gaps and move forward with our children's computer learning. The return to school at 50% is putting our children in an unknown new environment, nothing like their past, more cleaning, restrictive movement, and nothing like lunch with friends or a bus ride. My child would have four days and that's 100% exposure with both groups in the building, unless your plan is to be the opposite of the requirement for the least restrictive environment. Basically, we have two plans and neither have a solid foundation. This is a fluid time for parents, faculty, and students. Common knowledge is everybody wants to be safe. We have stated, I have stated, that I would rather go into a lion's den before sending my child. Tonight, this is where I am. I am in the board meeting advocating for my child and his education. Safety versus reading is not a great comparison for a student that's struggling in both. My son learns best hands-on, face-to-face. He's learning to advocate for himself. He wants to learn his trade. Schools, however, have the information that those things aren't available. I can't teach welding in my dining room. I thank you, I pray for your decision, 
and I lift all the students and the staff for a positive 2020-2021 school year. Thank you. Jahanza Akbar. Good evening. Um, thank you to the board for eliciting the feedback of teachers in the past um, week or so. Thank you especially to Ben Kim for the work that he's been doing in eliciting feedback from the students as well as the student senate members. Um, and while there are a number of teachers who have finally been given a platform to air their concerns, largely through the advocacy of our union, there's no such union that represents the concerns of our parents and students in the same way. I work at a Title I school that has needs that are unique from perhaps every other school in this county. With a dropout rate of anywhere from 10 to 15% in any given year, and with one in four students being chronically absent, I fear that this experience will lead us to see an even larger premature exodus of our students from our school system. The needs of our individual schools are not the same, and the success of the proposed plans is going to be relative to the unique situations at each school. Therefore, in advocacy of my students and in solidarity with my peers, I'd like to highlight the following points. First, I'd rather remain vigilant now than stand vigil as members of my community fall victim to this virus. Second, the way we interact and communicate with our parents needs to change. The phone surveys and the emails are touching only a fraction of our population. So you cannot base your decision solely based off of that. And those are the ones that are already engaged in the system. I propose that each school community establish communication trees where each staff member becomes responsible for being the POC for a group of families to ensure their questions are answered, their concerns, are uh, validated and that their students do not fall through the cracks. Third, we need to identify those students that are most at risk and not just with regard to EL status or special needs, but those who've been chronically absent under normal circumstances, those that are at risk of dropping out, and provide them with the technological support and to provide them with the physical space to learn virtually under the guidance and supervision of a staff member. These staff members who volunteer to be present should be compensated for that as well. So. I don't know what response you guys will choose. I just hope that you keep each of our individual schools in your minds and the fact that if you really care about equity, then that's what you would be paying attention to tonight. Thank you. Sonia Dorland. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Sonia Dorland. I'm from the Occoquan District. Please speak into the mic oh, a little bit louder. Sorry. Thanks. Sorry, um, Dr. Latif. Um, anyways, I'm Sonia Dorland from the Occoquan District. I would like to thank all of you and to give us this opportunity for tonight. And I would like to thank Ms. Zagapur and Ms. Williams for doing the online Zoom call for the kids. I really appreciate that you want to put them and give them the opportunity to have a chance to speak how they feel, because they really need that right now. And um, I know most of them want to go back, and some don't. Like mine, eh, he doesn't want to go back to work. <laughs> He's liking his Xbox. So anyways, my emotions have been really um, overwhelmed. And in the past weeks, I really wanted the model 50-50. But as the weeks have gone and it's changed and there's been more cases of the pandemic, I'm asking to start with virtual and gradually move toward um, going back maybe to a 50-50 model with maybe having, if you do half and half, maybe Monday, Tuesday, you have half the kids go, then you do a deep cleaning on Wednesday, then the next two days, you have the other half going on Thursday, Friday, and then do a deep cleaning over the weekend. I feel that that's helping, and then also with extra um, sanitation stations for the kids to sanitize their hands, extra masks, things of that nature. And then also, if we are going to start out virtually, um, that we have the teachers have extra capabilities of learning how to do virtual, because I know that not all of them know how to do that and it'd be great for them to have extra help and training to get there so um, also I ask that you start um, having teachers and staff oh that's what I just said well um, be ready to have as much help as they need and also for aides because I'm an aide and I help with a lot of LD students they're going to need that extra time and help 
online virtually for sure. Sorry, I just went out of time, but thank you so much. Liz Vohar. Good evening, Dr. Waltz, Chairman Latif, and school board members. My name is Liz Vohar, and I'm a proud Prince William County School school counselor, and my address is on file with the clerk. I first of all want to take the time to thank each of you for doing what you do. I don't envy you as you try to balance staff safety with parent requests. Over the past few weeks, I have heard a lot about the mental health of students and how worried everyone is about students not being able to return to normal. As a school counselor and licensed therapist myself, I too worry about this, but I also worry about the trauma students will face if we return. Students will not be able to socialize with peers as they did before schools closed. Social distancing measures, having to ensure students use only their own items, eating lunch in a classroom and reduced class sizes will ensure this. School is not just going to look different, it may even be unrecognizable to some. I fear that with all these restrictions in place, learning and socializing is going to be far and few between. Instead, time will be spent filling out and handing in daily health forms, being redirected to stay within their own three foot area and paying attention to what surface they just touched instead of learning. I worry about staff and students dying. While I know we have a county crisis team, schools are not adequately staffed with the correct ratios of counselors, social workers, and psychologists to be able to handle the amount of anxiety and grief students are going to have if and when we return. With all of that being said, I know counselors and teachers will return to buildings if we're directed to do so, because as educators, we show up time and time again. We sacrifice our own money, our own families, and now our own lives and health to take care and educate the children in this county. We will do so without hazard pay, without cost of living adjustments, and without PPE. We will do so with the echoes of parents thinking we don't do enough or that we just want to sit at home and get a paycheck. We will always show up for our students because that's what we do. Tonight, however, I'm just asking that you as a school board show up for us. Show up and speak up for staff, speak up for our lives, our health, and our families. Because while education is absolutely important, we matter. I beg you to please make a decision that allows for all of us to be safe. Thank you. Malik El Sherbini. Good evening, Dr. Waltz, Dr. Latif, and school board members. My name is Malik, and it's an honor for me to be able to come here and speak with you all today. I'm here to ask you to give us a choice to attend school in person, and I can tell you why I feel that way. I am a STEM student, so I have been trying to look at this in a scientific manner, and it has been very difficult as I've seen many adults on social media platforms trying to make their case. I'm extremely puzzled. In science, I learned that in a scientific crisis, we listen to health experts. I listen to Dr. Anthony Fauci, the CDC, and my pediatricians. They say we should try to be in a school in school when it's safe based on our local statistics. Still, people are talking about Texas and Arizona when we, they are trying to keep us at home. We live in Virginia where we shut down right away and followed medical advice. Then we are slowly reopening and now in phase three of COVID. We should not be comparing ourselves to Montgomery County as they're still in phase two of COVID. As my teachers would say, can we please focus on our own work instead of the person next to you? Now it's our time to say, can we listen to our own data and follow instructions from the experts based on that? Many people talk about the risk of COVID and going back, and I completely understand that, but we all take risks every day just by going into our cars, in sports teams and other medical fields and people working. To those who want virtual learning, I completely respect that. Please give them that option, but please don't let them take away my option to attend in-person school either. Thank you. Sarah Plumitalo. Good evening, Chairman Latif, members of the board, and Dr. Waltz. My name is Sarah Plumitalo, and I'm a proud PWCS employee of eight years. My address is on file with the clerk. I'm here tonight to plead with you to reconsider opening schools this fall. I am not here to present a well-researched argument or ask you a laundry list of probing questions. I'm here to ask you one. My solitary question is this. If you had the opportunity to save my life, would you do it? 
I can't stop thinking about the form letters that will be written by the communications department for teacher and students' deaths, seeing my colleagues' names and my students' names in ink, wondering if I'm next or if my family is. I can't stop thinking about the choice that I have to make. Do I try and get a medical exemption to teach virtually? I have a few risk factors that might qualify me, but can I live with that? Can I live with sitting behind a computer screen knowing the colleagues I've been with my entire career are working or walking into our school building every day, putting themselves at risk? Can I live with one of them dying and me living? How would I face the rest of my colleagues when this is all over? Are they gonna resent me? It's not as easy as saying I'm gonna protect my family and myself. It's more to it than that. And so my husband and I have started preparing for the very real possibility that I'll return to school. We've talked about guardianship for our kids should the worst happen. We've talked about if I can even live at home because I can't risk bringing COVID back to my house. Am I disciplined enough not to hug my children until further notice? Maintain my distance from everyone and sleep in a separate room than my husband? All to ensure that they're safe. And if I do go back, how will I even cope every day at work with the new normal? It's anything but normal. Wearing a mask for seven hours, physically distancing every moment of the day. Wondering if that cough or sniffle or flushed look on my student's face is the common cold or COVID-19. What is that daily stress gonna be like? What is it gonna do to my health, to our health? You have a choice to make. It's not an easy one because whatever you do is gonna make someone unhappy. But last week, everyone sat on that Zoom call and affirmed that PWCS's number one priority is the health and safety of students and staff. So I ask you again, if you had the opportunity to save my life, would you do it? Because now is that opportunity, right now. And if your top, your top priority truly is the health and safety of all students and staff, Thank you. Thank you, sir. then that answer should be clear. Rose Quint. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rose Quint. I have two kids in the school system, and I've also come here today to ask you just one question. I want to ask you to base the decision that you're gonna make tonight on, on results from the surveys that were posted on your website last week on the majority opinion of the teachers and parents of this county. As it turns out, you sent a survey to parents and to uh, teachers last, last month, and 80% of us parents said that we are willing and able to send our, t our kids back to school. 80%, 79% of teachers said they're willing and ready to come back to school. So I'm asking you today to base your vote on the majority opinion of your teachers and your parents. That is a reliable sample. It's a reliable representative universe, the responses to those surveys. Um, there are a lot of passionate people in this room today and outside. They are not a representative sample of the universe of parents and teachers. These studies are. Thank you very much. Elizabeth Holliger. Hello, my name is Beth Holliger and I'm a first grade teacher with the county. Thank you, Superintendent Waltz, Chairman, the board, and all of the hardworking Prince William County staff who've been working tirelessly on this difficult decision. And thank you for all the teachers here tonight outside in the parking lot showing their support. As educators, we're no strangers to data. Every day, we are expected to use data to inform our decisions in the classroom to ensure the safety and success of our students. I ask now that data be used in this decision as well as COVID um, cases continue to increase. I'm concerned about the safety of my students and colleagues under the 50% model. Logistically, I'm concerned with the feasibility of this option. How will safety drills be conducted? What might a fire or secure the building drill look like with social distancing and not mixing student groups? How can we support our vulnerable students while still ensuring their safety? When I'm thinking about my first grade class last year, about 75% of them were considered in this vulnerable group. How can 75% of my class attend almost daily when only 50% are allowed in school at one time? As educators, we know math. We value the mathematicians and statisticians who provide us with data on this pandemic. As educators, we know science. We value the expertise that scientists and medical professionals provide us in this pandemic. As educators, we know the humanities, and that humanity is what brought so many of us here tonight. We love our students. We dedicate our lives to teaching, we should not have to give our lives. Thank you. 
Megan Miller. Ladies and gentlemen of the school board, thank you for taking time to be here and hear from your community. It means a lot to me, as I'm sure it does to everybody else here today, both in person and virtually. Uh, it's reassuring to see so many people, both in this room and outside today, that care so intensely about our students and our teachers. I am not a teacher in Prince William County. I'm not a parent in Prince William County. Uh, I work at Huntington Learning Center in Lake Ridge, and I interact with parents, teachers, and students on a daily basis. So the decision that you make today doesn't just affect the school, the students going to school, or their parents, or their teachers. It affects everybody. Um, Children need to be learning. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. And in an ideal world, that would mean that children are in school because we know that that is the best option for many families. Uh, the answer here is not one size fits all. There's no answer in which everybody wins. Um, I've spent the last couple of weeks talking to teachers and students and, and, and parents that I come across and asking them what their questions are and how I can be an advocate for them since I don't myself fall into any of those categories. Um, I think we can all agree that we are not living in an ideal world right now and we need to be seeking alternatives to the system that has worked for us so long but will no longer be working for us. At Huntington, our goal is always to ensure that every student gets the best education possible, and I've learned in my years that that means something different for every single student. Um, the 50% model, the 25% model, honestly, even the virtual model, uh, all aren't gonna work for every single student. Um, and what I came here to say today is that there are so many questions and there are so many concerns with all three options. There has not been enough time to answer all of these questions and all of these concerns and all of the what ifs that go with it. Um, I come from a math background. Numbers are what makes sense to me. The current data shows that children uh, are 1.7% of the COVID cases in the United States. 4% of those cases are fatal. Thank you, uh, Ms. Miller. Maggie Hansford. Hi, everyone. Um, as many of you know, I'll be starting a new role as Prince William Education Association president in a couple of weeks. I want to start out by thanking board members and division leadership for meeting with me these last couple of weeks and including me in the process. I know there's no perfect solution given our budget realities, but I think we can and we must find equitable standards for safety um, while providing a world-class education this fall. To that end, after participating in multiple meetings and looking over the plans, it is clear that we are unable to afford to safely implement the 50% return plan. Last year, I ran for Board of County Supervisors and a mom as, an, as a mom and educator on a platform for fully funding our schools and investing in our community. I haven't been shy to say our schools are underfunded and for decades our county budgets have been balanced on the backs of our teachers. On a good day, we do not have the funding we need, let alone on a bad day, and today is a bad day. We are in the midst of a global pandemic and our schools are over $40 million short to safely fund a 50% return to school plan. Keeping budget realities in mind, it would be irresponsible to ask staff to physically open without adequate protections in place. I know we don't currently have the funding to open safely, and any additional funding we may receive from the Board of County Supervisors will be inefficient. What I do know we have is time. We have time, if you vote on a plan tonight, to allow our parents and staff to plan for a world-class virtual education this fall. We need our school board to lead tonight to make a decision that protects staff and students, and you have my word, I will stand with you and demand additional funding from our Board of County Supervisors and state legislators. I am committed to working together with the division and board to implement tonight's plan. I have asked Dr. Waltz to continue meeting weekly with me to ensure our staff feels safe and trust the process of returning to school. I thank Dr. Latif for committing to weekly discussions to ensure trust with staff during this difficult time. I am committed, our staff is committed, and I'm hopeful the division and school board are committed to keeping teachers, staff, and students healthy. Please open with a 100% virtual plan and then continue to assess our ability to open safely. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie Hansford. That will be the last um, in-person um, who signed up. Um, we're gonna move to the virtual 
part of the uh, citizen comment time. Um, Jason Stevens, um, I will turn it over to you. Our first speaker will be Janice Sullivan, and I guess you'll manage that. Yes, sir, uh, Mr. Chairman, she is unmuted. Um, Janice Sullivan, you have the floor. Great. Hello, my name is Dr. Janice Sullivan. Good evening, Dr. Latif, school board members, Dr. Waltz, and community. I'm a mother of two young children with special needs, and I'm an officer of the Prince William County Special Education PTA. I'm also a local family physician. I'll be taking care of babies, children, adults, and the elderly in urgent and primary care clinics in our community. Growing up in Williamsburg, a small town, I value community engagement and service. Prince William County has been home for me for the past six years, and I am proud to serve and be a part of this community, not just for its diversity, many opportunities, and cherished relationships formed, but also because of the amazing educators, especially in special education that I've gotten to know through my children and SEPTA. I know everyone has worked tirelessly to address concerns regarding the return to school, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Since the last meeting, my mind has been wrought with questions, emotions, grief, and peace. After considering all proposals and sides, thinking that 100% virtual will be the most appropriate option for my children in light of their challenges in wearing masks and following social distancing guidelines. Each child, family, and household are different and have unique needs and circumstances. I ask, whatever the final vote is, that the school board and leaders all continue to do their best to remain transparent, transparent and realistic, giving staff and parents ample information to make plans accordingly. Specifically, I especially hope teachers and staff in special education have solid guidance and support. For parents and students with IEPs and 504 plans, I hope we are given the details of what special education services will look like, in particular on teacher assignment, grading, and parent training, so we can make informed decisions. I also ask if home visits by SPED teachers could be considered in an outdoor home environment, especially since they've been doing this with ESY. Lastly, I hope the school will continue to encourage all community members to take care of their overall health, including to continue to work on tolerance with wearing masks and staying up to date with wellness visits and flu immunizations. With that, I wish you all well and I support you in our community as we look forward for all students going back to in-person instruction one day. Thank you. Susan Burhouse or Jason, I'll, I'll have you call the names. Why don't you do that so I don't mess this up? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Okay, am I ready? Yes, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for the chance to address you tonight. And thank you for all of the thought and work you've put into the solid, safe return to school plans. Um, I can't do my thanks justice because I only have two minutes. It's really short, but really, thank you. Um, I'm here tonight to ask for your continued support for the 50% hybrid model. As the FAQs online note, that is the robust education experience. Although it's, of course, critical to provide the option for virtual learning for those students and teachers who prefer it, there are many, many students for whom virtual activities simply won't work, especially when those activities don't maximize live synchronous instruction. And we need options for those students as well. And my oldest son has taken three virtual high school classes with Prince William County. And as he began those classes, you know, the county distributed materials, stressing that virtual is not for everyone. You know, at orientation, they stress that the only students who can succeed virtually are those who want to learn independently, who have a strong desire to manage their own education, who have excellent time management skills. I mean, that's a really high bar that Prince William County set. I don't think I'm selling my kids too short when I admit to you that they don't meet that bar. Of course, I'd like them to work on that, but they're not there yet. So based on these past experiences and on the descriptions that have been provided regarding the asynchronous and, and flexible nature of the proposed virtual schooling, I just can't have my kids in a learning model that by design is just not meant for them. So while I ask that you continue to support the hybrid plan, I also ask that face-to-face -face instruction be increased substantially in any and all virtual offerings. Um, I ask that you pay particular attention to students in transition years, high school students, or older students, seniors, those in advanced classes. We're not hearing a lot about them, but, but the stereotypes here aren't true. These are not all perfect, mature, super whiz kids who can just do it all on their own. I mean, their class discussions, Socratic seminars, debates, and teachers themselves cannot be replaced by recorded content. Our kids and teachers need each other now more than ever. Thank you. Sabrina okay, Red. Can you hear me? Your mic is open. Hello? You can hear me? 
Okay, thank you. Um, Sabrina Red, I, uh, my information's on file. I spoke to the board last week. Um, I have a child in the special needs class at Ashland Elementary. I have another child that's gonna be going to Porter. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Zarkafor and Ms. Walls for responding to my emails. I have two asks. Um, uh, last week, I supported the 50% the model. I'm leaning now that you consider seriously opening with the virtual model for a brief period of time. I'm very concerned that we're not prepared um, to meet all of the challenges that you guys are grappling with. And frankly, for our teachers, I spoke last week in support of the 50% uh, uh, model out of a desire to have my child, my children go back and have basic based instruction. But I I don't know how um, our teachers are going to be safe and how that means safety for my children. Um, I also asked previously that we please um, look at more options for special education. I am disheartened, to say the least, that we don't have better communication to the special education families. My child has the kinds of conditions that if he gets ill, he will die. Um, I don't have any option but to keep him home. Special education office has not communicated with me as a parent who um, has to meet these challenges and figure out how I'm going to make him safe and educated to tell me what does this mean if I'm in virtual? Do I lose our placement? Do my related services look the same? How am I going to support his needs? Um, so my second ask is that you please start communicating better with your special education constituency because we don't know when we're asking ourselves on Facebook and the FAQs that are out there speak to the general education population. Um, there's nothing in the, the class models that have been put up there on the website that show us what the special education or resource rooms are going to look like. How are the teacher's aides going to be safe? Um, I really think that we need to slow down and not rush to wrong. When I was in the military, we did exercises, we did practices for um, combat missions and conflicts, and I'm not saying this is one of them, but we need to practice. We need to put our uh, teachers, our front line, in an environment where they know how they're going to deal with these contingencies. And right now, we're guessing at best. So I think delaying till September 8th is nice, but we need more time. And please have the Office of Special Education do a listening session with the families that are have to make these tremendously scary decisions. Thank you. Rebecca Anderson. Can you hear me now? Yes, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. My name is Rebecca Anderson. I'll be starting my 15th year teaching elementary general music in Prince William County Schools this fall. As an elementary music specialist, I teach every child in my school. Students in grades K through four are ages 10 and under, which means that almost all the students that I teach wouldn't be required to wear masks if we had class in person. If a student in my school tests positive for COVID-19, during the incubation period, I've come in contact with that student or with a sibling of that student. I've continued to teach every student in my school. In the evenings, I've come home to my family. My spouse is also an elementary music teacher and our children are enrolled at his school. So my entire family has been exposed. My spouse has now come in contact with every student that he teaches. Between my spouse and I, we teach a total of 1400 students. And the classroom teacher at my school who's teaching the student who tested positive as a middle schooler and a high schooler at home. They've been attending all of their in-person classes regularly. One positive case in one elementary school has now spread the virus through four different schools and to thousands of people. And these are just a few of the reasons that I cannot sleep at night. The pandemic is not convenient for anybody. School is going to be open this fall and we will return to learn, but this entire discussion is only about whether school buildings will be where that learning takes place. Please vote for the safest and most equitable choice for all, a 100% virtual model with an in-person opt-in for qualifying subgroups such as special ed and ELL. To my students, I am really excited to teach you new content this fall. I miss your faces, voices, and sense of humor. May we all safely and virtually stay connected during this difficult time. I'd also like to remind Dr. Latif to keep on his mask, and I'm wondering why nobody wiped down the podium between speakers tonight. Thank you. Muhammad Abdullah Yusufzai. Good evening. My name is Abdullah Yusufzai, and I'm a rising junior at Battlefield High School. 
I'm also a member of the PWCS Student Senate for the upcoming school year. My address is in Haymarket. After attending town hall sessions for Ms. Zargapur, Ms. Williams, Ms. Walls, and Mr. Wilk over the past three days, I wanted to share a few comments and concerns on behalf of my peers, younger siblings, my parents, and myself. First and foremost, many individuals face situations that make it unsafe for them to attend the school building for the upcoming school year. Because of this, students will have no choice but to choose the virtual learning option, which creates disparity. Under Plan 3, or the 50% model, virtual students will be put at a disadvantage in comparison to their school attending peers who will get more instructional time, office hours, and motivation in a schoolhouse environment. Contrast this with virtual students who receive none of this. If we want to go for the most equitable solution possible, as we did back in the spring, Plan 3 or the hybrid model is in no way, shape, or form the way to go. Thus, as a member of the PWCS Student right. Senate, I advocate that the school board approves Plan 1 or the all-virtual model, which has been used by colleges, universities, and other educational institutions for years with online classes. Via the all-virtual model, which has been tried and tested, Students will not be putting themselves or loved ones at risk. This is especially important here in Prince Philan County that has been A, seeing a continuous rise in cases since March, according to Johns Hopkins, and B, has schools that are heavily over capacity, such as my own Battlefield High School, which is 50% over capacity. If the all virtual model is approved, funding that will not be used for keeping school buildings open can be allocated towards providing computers, internet access, counseling for mental health, childcare programs, as these are the primary issues holding our families back from virtual learning. Ultimately, schools should not be used as political footballs as most adults are doing these days. We should approach this issue by considering if we are ready on a societal level, which we are simply not. If we want to put safety, equality, and quality of education first, I urge that the school board approves the all virtual model in order to ensure that our students receive a world-class education. I also wanted to take a quick moment to thank all the members of the school board for their hard work and leadership throughout the pandemic. Thank you very much for your time. Tiffany Power. No? Do you guys hear yes. me? Yes, you have the floor. Ooh, oh God, okay. Hi, my name is Tiffany Power and I'm a teacher here in Prince William County's public school system. Over the course of the past six months, I've seen the public's view of my role shift from an educator to a babysitter and now a sacrificial lamb. Neither of these roles are ever mentioned as part of the job when you're acquiring a degree to educate our future. Though, after hundreds or thousands of hours of interactions with your kids, we slip into the caretaker role becoming their therapists, coaches, nurses, and mentors, and we learn to love and care for every student we work with, and even those we don't. Today, I'm advocating for my life and my students' life. I teach at a Title I school here in Prince William County that is 51% Hispanic, 28% African American, 9% white, and the rest are other persons of color. African Americans and persons of color are five times more likely to die from COVID-19 versus those that are white. This is due to longstanding systemic health and social inequities that, are, that cause marginalized groups to be at an increased risk of getting COVID-19. These are all important factors when considering that our students are not only going through a pandemic, but they're also in the middle of a civil rights movement. Most schools within Prince William County have a higher percentage of people of color that attend school. When we say that we want to send our students back, we're ignoring the fact that people of color are more likely to contract COVID and die from it due to a lack of resources available. I don't want to attend the funeral of one of my students due to COVID-19. Do you? Not when I know that this could have been prevented. As a school board, you are in charge of what happens with our fate. We can always start off virtually and then switch to in-person because as a teacher, I cannot wait to see my students in person when it's safe but I'm not willing to put even one of their lives or their family's lives at risk for parents looking to bring normalcy back into their students' lives. You're not gonna find it at school. Instead of a school building, you'll find desks that are three feet apart, anxious staff trying to be welcoming behind a mask, students being told not to touch their friends, no lunchroom eating, no normal recess, and last, they won't get that hug they've so desperately been wanting from their teachers since the quarantine began. So lastly, I pose to you this question. How do you wanna be remembered in these historic times? as a school board that went virtual until it's safe, or the board that threw students, staff, and teachers into a building with acceptable losses. I need you as a school, school board to take action and not just listen by copying and pasting an email to people concerned for their lives. Thank you. Tiziana Botino. Mr. Chairman, the next um, 
participant that we have that's actually online is James Martin, uh, Jim Martin. You can unmute your microphone. Hey, good evening. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. I'd like first to thank the uh, school board for their efforts in uh, forming the uh, return to school program. Um, I realize you're constrained by the restrictions from the state and the CDC, but uh, I would offer that the restrictions don't match the data. The CDC reports that uh, ages 1 to 17 only represents 6 cases and 0.3% of the deaths. Uh, in, in Virginia or in the nation, we're only at a 9% positivity rating. Uh, and uh, our age group in the school system only re represents 127 hospitalizations in the state over the course of the pandemic. Uh, I'd like you to uh, consider developing a plan to return to full in-person instruction as recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, and, we, and in with that, we need to develop some type of metrics to develop that, whether that be uh, positivity, hospitalization rates, or death rates. And uh, I'd also ask that our the school guidelines match the state guidelines. Right now, the state is opening up in large measures, but the school seems to be locking down, even though this this age group is less susceptible to the virus. Uh, I also support the teachers should not be overworked. Uh, online and in-person instruction is too much for the teachers. Uh, in addition to the cleaning, I would suggest that one teacher per grade level be responsible for the virtual instruction. And I would encourage that all parents still have the accessibility of 100% virtual instruction if they choose to do so. But other, other parents have the ability to send their parents, children to school. Um, this will accommodate older and at-risk teachers. It deals with uh, bandwidth issues in the school. And I would encourage you, don't let the loud voices of a limited number of parents overrule the majority of the group. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Melinda Landry. You can unmute your microphone. Okay, you have the floor. Good evening, school board. I wanna thank especially Ms. Zargapur, my elected school board member for responding to my emails um, in a personal manner. I really do appreciate her time and effort in that. I'm coming to you as a Prince William County teacher of over 13 years, a teacher itself of over 20 years, and former parent of three students who have come through the Prince William County school system. I wanna to talk to you about my concerns about the 50% hybrid plan. I saw the tentative schedule that was put out for high school earlier today. Um, as you can, as most people would know, uh, in high school, I'll see my students once a week, except for first block. And according to this new tentative schedule, I would be seeing those first block students uh, twice during the week. I wanna mention specifically about first block because most of the people who have been speaking haven't been talking about that. Block one with staggered arrivals will have constant interruptions to class. Developmentally, even high schoolers require redirect time after every disruption. On task instructional time will be affected during that block. I wanna mention again that one of the benefits of the hybrid model, especially for science teachers like myself, was supposed to be that we could do CER type activities, labs and case studies, labs of course, without any shared materials and without anyone working directly together. But all of those activities could have been done, which includes whole class discussion. Thus, because of the first block schedule, it means it's not possible to have any activity that requires students to be at the same step at the same time. First block students will always suffer compared to their, their peers in other blocks. I also wanna mention some of my continuing concerns about mask wearing. Um, many of those answers haven't been given uh, clearly, at least to my, um, to my level of understanding. Mandatory mask wearing is supposedly going to be added to the code of behavior, but what will happen to those students who won't keep a mask on? We know that code of behavior issues are not always enforced. It's just the way it is. In this case, however, enforcement is necessary due to health threats to our staff and to our students and to the other employees of Prince William County Schools. Where will these students go? The ones who refuse to wear masks or who are repeated viola violators of the mask rule. 
Okay, we're going to move on to the next speaker. I'll try to keep your comments under two minutes. Um, Angela Stauffer, you can unmute your microphone. Angela Stauffer. Ah, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, okay great. Before. Thank you. I'm uh, speaking to you as a citizen of Prince William County and also a teacher of, uh, gosh, 28 years and 15 of them in Prince William County. And I am strongly in favor of the 100% virtual model. Um, I want to be in class with my students. I have been a teacher for as many years as I have been because I love students, but I feel like we really need to have a better plan for how we are going to be safe. And I feel like this stilted model where we have to keep distance from each other, there won't be any one-on-one -on -one, uh, with me and a student, there won't be group work, they won't be able to share. I just don't know how that really equates to what is good education. I have been diligently taking professional development classes, some that the school has offered, others that I have found on my own. And I am genuinely excited about some of the practices I have um, found that allow me to incorporate students into small groups while online. And while this isn't an ideal situation, the COVID pandemic, pandemic is also not an ideal situation, but I would really like the opportunity for us to do the best we can in a safe manner and possibly, you know, definitely reevaluate at the end of nine weeks and maybe get into the schools 50% and just do it in a safe way because even if we aren't, you know, my dad told me people aren't dying from this as much anymore and, uh, you know, whatever dad, but the bottom line is people are getting really sick and I don't, I don't want any of us to be really sick because we went to school before we had a good plan to keep everybody safe. Thank you for allowing us to give these comments. I appreciate it. Okay, our next speaker is Mariana Lulchenko. I am here, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for your time. I'm a parent of an elementary and middle schooler, each at a specialty program here in Prince William County. I wanna start by illuminating a strong point that I have not heard through many of these meetings. Children do not appear to be catching or spreading the virus like adults, because the one and best mitigation strategy that the state took was closing schools first and keeping them closed. This kept our kids safe, and thankfully none have died in Virginia. The latest numbers from the Virginia Department of Health show that 12% of the county's cases are children ages zero to 19. Multi-inflammatory syndrome, albeit slowly, are now at seven cases statewide, with two in Prince William. In a single classroom of the proposed 16 to 18 children, even if one is asymptomatic and carries it to school, they have already contributed to the exponential spread of this virus in their class, to other students through specialty teachers and bathrooms, all the families and so on. Sanitation will not be and cannot be expected to be done on a routine enough basis to keep everything clean. This isn't about taking a higher risk. We shouldn't be taking any risk that uses staff and families as laboratory mice in an experiment that will, not if, result in cases and lead to school closure again. The stringency of class formats means kids are not getting back the social experiences they have missed out on. There is no normal and the stressors for kids and staff to maintain distance and effective health measures will overrule any positive gains from two days of in-person attendance. We are a community. Although nice, we shouldn't always expect to have choice. Sometimes a tough decision needs to be made that is the safest option for everyone, and that is the virtual schoolhouse. Yes, there will be challenges, but no challenge is greater nor unnecessary to endure than having a child or loved one suffer through this illness and possibly die. If we need an area of compromise, students who receive special education or whose needs cannot be met through virtual learning should be the only ones receiving in-person instruction or even better, homebound one-to-one -one services. 
with the Cannabis and Mastery Connect platforms and quality professional development, online instruction can be effective with the virtual schoolhouse. Prince William Schools. Okay, our next speaker is Jamila Galt. You can unmute your microphone, Jamila Galt. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. As a 13 year special ed teacher in this county, I've been trying to find a word to express my thoughts about school opening back up, and each time I'm overcome with emotion. The same emotions that teachers feel year after year when new policies, testing requirements, demands, and workloads are placed upon us. Except this time, instead of it being a matter of getting a meet standards or exceed standards, we're talking about life and death. This pandemic has proven that it will break you down organ by organ and system by system, no matter if you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, or other. And although there are disparities within different racial groups, I find no additional comfort in being black, 40, and in good health because I'm staying at home. I'm wearing masks when I go out if I have to. I wash my clothes when I come home. I'm up all hours of the night buying Lysol online, stocking up, making my own hand sanitizer while logging my children onto some academic website regularly, having my seven-year-old do her flashcards at night while her twin sisters write book reports. My husband and I have shut down our church indefinitely, and we work weekly on prayer calls, Bible study materials, sermons, anything to stay engaged. No beach, no cruise, but I'm alive and well. Our government has done a poor job of keeping us safe and being up front. Instead, they downplayed this virus, called it a hoax, and caused over 130,000 people to die unnecessarily, including eight people I know personally. Now they are wearing masks. They have now opened their facilities. They're working remotely, yet they're talking about open up schools. Politics and economics are secondary to a health crisis, and it deserves to be treated as such. And the convenience of school being virtual only should protect lives and should supersede the need to add more money to one's bank account. We can rebuild the economy, but not with dead bodies as collateral. 100% virtual is the safest way to go. Thank you to Lily Jesse, Justin Wilk, and Lori Williams for responding to my emails, and thank you all for your time. Please vote 100% virtual. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Shannon Atkinson. Am I unmuted? Yeah, speak, uh, try to speak closer to your microphone. You're a little quiet. Okay, <clears throat> is this better? Yes, go ahead. Okay, my name is Shannon Atkinson. My address is on file. I'm speaking to you tonight as a parent of a high school student as well as a healthcare worker. I work in the home health setting and I have provided care to COVID patients both in their homes and in assisted living facilities and independent facilities. I had been leaning towards the 50% model, but I've really been struggling with it in the past week due to the fact that PPE has become harder and harder to get. I work for the fourth largest home health company in the country. And I can tell you that right now, and when I treat a COVID patient, I'm essentially wearing a glorified plastic bag as my protection. I do not think that you can ethically send your staff into a uh, group setting without directly providing PPE for them. I've read that the PPE that will be provided has to come from each individual school budget. I seriously have problems with this. My company provides me with a mask, a gown, a face shield, and gloves, as well as hand sanitizer. We should be providing this to each and every teacher for every classroom. We should also be providing hand sanitizing and hand washing stationed at every single entrance to every single school in our county. This is truly the only way we'll be able to open safely. I would like to also add to the former um, person's comment about the multi-systems inflammatory syndrome. While yes, this is a rare syndrome, I personally believe it's rare because we have as a country gone out of our way to protect our young children. The um, older people don't seem to be getting the syndrome. However, it can be life threatening for younger children with over 80% of children that contract this being hospitalized. Please do it safe and go for a virtual model. Thank you. Okay, 
Okay, our next speaker is Sarah Coolball Mercado. Sarah Coolball Mercado. If you unlock or unmute your microphone, there you go. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak. I have three children, a preschooler, a second grader, and a high school senior. I am here to advocate for in-school learning. It can be very difficult for some students to be able to concentrate on their schoolwork with the many distractions of their room and the house in general. Many students focus a lot better in the classroom, in the actual building. Students like this deserve a quality education also. Some children learn better on a computer while some need the classroom setting. I love Prince William County for their specialty programs. Please, these must be continued. I hear people speaking of just focusing on the core classes. The specialty programs are our children's future and frankly, their education affects everyone's future. Same for the electives. Most of the time, these are picked with the child's career in mind. I would like to request that this decision gets reassessed at least every quarter and um, that the teachers in the classroom need to be those that want to be there. The teachers can't be scared of the students. They need to be able to make them feel safe and comfortable. It's really important to show our students that school is important. The two week delay, will this be made up? School is important and we need to show this to the students. They already had a virtual loss of 100 days. An idea of see through masks like they have for the deaf might be a great solution for the teachers of preschool through third grade. These children thrive seeing a teacher full of enthusiasm and smiles. The speech classes must resume and cannot happen with a mask. Um, the internet going out at home or the sitters, will they be marked absent? That would not be their fault. They want to be in class, but maybe having computer issues at home. Recess, we, we work so hard to get recess time. Um, it's still important for our children and important for their development. There has been a 92% reduction in deaths. It's time to open up. These children deserve a great school year. Seniors, everything. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Riley O'Casey. Riley O'Casey, you can mute. There you go. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Latif, board members, Dr. Waltz. My name is Riley O'Casey and my address is on file. You all know that I usually love to be there in person, person seeing your smiles, but I'm at home waiting for the results of my COVID test. Uh, a little anxious, um, but hopeful. As the current but outgoing president of the Prince William Education Association, I represent our members and close to 90% of our members have expressed concerns about returning to school. The concerns are from educators who love their jobs, they love their students, but they do not want to lose their lives. They do not want to lose their family members and they do not want to attend funerals for their students. Prince William County School employees are contemplating returning or resigning. They are updating their wills. I repeat, they are updating their wills. This is unacceptable. Board members, you have a tough decision to make tonight. I personally wanna thank you for reaching out to PWEA to have the crucial important conversations needed during this time of fear and anxiety. Please listen to the people who will be in the classrooms, on the buses, making the food, in the trenches, and dealing with the unknowns. I'd also like to thank the superintendent and his staff for their tireless and very unappreciated work. Please vote for a 100% virtual return. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jason Thorpe. You can unmute your microphone, Jason Thorpe. Hi there. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity, board. Um, everyone has said very eloquently about the same things that I would have said. I just want to add this. Um, I'm ex-military and I worked in the communications IT field. And I noticed this last quarter, I've got an elementary school, uh, elementary school student in um, Mountain View Elementary. And I love our principal, I love our teachers there, but a lot of them were not uh, technically oriented and the IT was lacking. 
um, in several areas. And this has been an issue which, when I was on the advisory committee at Haymarket Elementary, and I'd go to the board meetings, has been a constant issue. The bandwidth for uh, the, the school system has been constantly needing to be upgraded, as well as new computers and other things. And I spent a lot of time with our teachers trying to help them just get by and learn uh, teams and other things um, that they just didn't have any training in. What I think is being missed here, because you know, I, I'm, I'm not advocating for anything but 100% virtual because I think that's the way to go. But in that, I think there's a missed opportunity here if we don't look at this in terms of also solving future budgetary constraints where we can't build more buildings. I know uh, the universities have experienced this and they have thought about going to virtual sessions and more virtual and online classes just to handle that issue. I think that you know some of the other um, school districts that um, Manassas and, and some of the uh, uh, larger districts in Maryland have already voted for 100% virtual. I think if money was spent to upgrade this, it wouldn't just handle this current COVID situation, but it would also uh, handle our future expansion needs because we're a rapidly growing county. And I think that's the wave of the future of school and education anyway. And this is something that we really need to invest in. Our next speaker is Kathy Rivera. You can unmute your microphone, Kathy Rivera. Okay. Hi. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the staff for all the work that you've been doing on this plan. My name is Kathy Rivera. I'm in the Gainesville, uh, Brentsville district living in Gainesville. I have had four children in the Prince William County schools, and I'm here to advocate to get our children into school. I agree with the American Academy of Pediatrics that our children need to be in school and need to learn. I understand that there's a lot of concern, both with families and teachers. And I also believe that those parents and teachers should be given the opportunity to um, choose 100% virtual uh, and those teachers who meet the risk factors that the CDC has laid out, not just the high risk factors, but the second tier, which includes asthma, for example, of children should also be given that opportunity. I think this is where our site-based management is failing us. We should not be having principals make those decisions about staff. We should also not have principals making decisions about PPE. I don't know if this is true, but something that is floating around that principals will be the ones who will decide how much PPE teachers have and I think this is a mistake. We should be getting all of our um, communities involved in collecting PPE if it is needed for our schools, for all of our schools, so all staff have the same opportunity to have that protection and feel protected. I also believe that our students have missed out greatly. We know that the spring was difficult. Virtual learning will not work for everyone. I do not have children with special needs, but they will struggle with virtual learning. And I can't imagine what any special ed students and those who are special ed but don't qualify to be in person will be struggling with. Please get our children back to school, begin with the 50% model and work towards 100% back in school. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yvonne Guerrero Lloyd. You are signed in twice, so I'm not sure which oh, microphone me, you use there. Let me see. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, you have the floor, thank you. Okay, um, hello Prince William County board members, school staff and fellow parents. Thank you for taking a moment to hear my thoughts. I have three kids attending Prince William County schools, seventh, fifth, grade and entering kindergarten. I know we all have different feelings and beliefs of the issues we are dealing with right now and I respect all of you and your opinions with understanding we all want what's best for our children. With that said to the voting board members, I ask you to please consider before you vote that we still do not have a vaccine for this virus. And while complications can seem less severe in children, there is still a percentage of children who have shown severe complications and some with new complications being described, such as multi-symptom inflammatory syndrome. Currently treatments for COVID-19 and the CDC are going case by case. Why can't we at least see how things are going with this virus in the next few weeks and if possible, take it quarter by quarter? 
This way our teachers, staff, and students are safe and teachers also have time to focus on virtual learning and not being thrown into a hectic schedule of managing both virtual and in-class teaching. Spring cannot be compared to what the future plans will be. Summer school has given me hope that virtual school to start the year will be great. I have watched my son's summer school teacher, Ms. Reyes, have control over her class as if she were in person. I am amazed at her ability to teach so well and be so engaging. I don't know if she has had training for virtual school, but I'm confident with the virtual plan. I say, why not protect our children, teachers, and staff for a little bit longer instead of rushing into a potentially hazardous environment until we learn more? In closing, I ask you to please consider making Prince William County Schools a school county to follow during this pandemic, not one to learn from. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Cunningham. Shisaka Cunningham. Yes. Yes. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Shisaka Cunningham and my address is on file. Um, thank you, school board. Um, for having me. Um, I'm coming to you today as a concerned parent, as a concerned spouse of a, of a Prince William County uh, teacher, and uh, as a scientist. I'm actually a virologist that is uh, working on setting up a, a COVID testing facility here to help with the capacity in the state. Um, I'm concerned in the sense that I don't believe that having uh, children in school at this time is safe. I feel like until we can have a situation where we can have consistent testing and contact tracing among everyone, uh, that it's it's gonna present a risk. Um, I think it's unrealistic to expect school-aged children to adhere to PPE rules. Uh, I know they'll try their best, but I work in a laboratory and I see people in the laboratory having trouble with that. So I can only imagine five, six and seven-year-olds trying to do that. I'm urging the school board to really take into consideration uh, the science around it. Um, this is a virus, it's a public health issue. It's not a political issue. I personally really wanna send my kids back to school. I would like to have the feeling that we're, it was safe to do that. I do not feel that way. And I agree with many of the other uh, parents and teachers that have expressed uh, concern in this regard. Um, we're just not at a level to do that. I'm also concerned about uh, uh, sending students back to school for even a short period of time in the fall, given the fact that we may experience a very uh, worse uh, uh, situation in the fall with the impending uh, flu season coming. So you'll have flu season and COVID going on at the same time in the fall, which will probably require a shutdown of schools anyway. So you work very hard to, to get the, the two day situation happening, uh, but it won't even uh, be worthwhile because you wind up having to shut school because of a, a growing public health crisis. So I'm encouraging a uh, uh, vote for, for solution number one, uh, to have virtual school as painful as it'll be for some, I think it's the, the most safe and effective way. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Wendy. You have the floor. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. All right, thank you for your time. Uh, my friend, the teacher posted the following. A colleague of 20 years at states, counties, and districts across the country make decisions about opening schools. I respect that each of us is coming from a different set of circumstances. If there's ever time to remind our communities just how essential teachers are, it is now. I get that everyone is scared and I get that there's a lot to consider. I also get that my worries, fears, questions, and concerns are not above any others. Our first responders, law enforcement officers, firefighters, doctors, nurses, farmers, truck drivers, postal workers, Amazon boxers, uh, Walmart stockers, and everyone in between have all the same fears, questions, and concerns, and they have been showing up to work for us every single day for the last four months. Now it's our turn, our kids need us, our parents need us, our communities need us. Time to get back to work, full time, in person, back to work, end quote. Uh, and I did some research today on the CDC as of today, July 15th. Across the entire United States, 135,991 deaths from COVID since February of this year. Of all of those deaths, 31 have been children under the age of 15 or 0.02%. 31 COVID deaths. During the same period of time, over 100 have died from the flu. Of those younger students between five and 14 years, which are in school age, uh, there have been 14 deaths across the entire United States. For Virginia, 1,961 people have died from COVID. Zero are children under 15. 
zero deaths from COVID under 15 in the entire state of Virginia. Children are low risk for COVID, both in contraction and spreading to you teachers. There's a lot of teachers online and I understand your concerns, but children are low uh, risk for spreading to others. My firstborn starts kindergarten this fall. How can anyone on this line logically think that a kindergartner of five years old can learn online? He needs to be in school with his teachers, with his friends. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Amina Azim. Amina Azim, I apologize if I mispronounced. A-Z-I-M is the last name. Interesting. Here. Okay. Um, you. Can you Thank hear you. me? Yes, you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Fariza Saeba, um, an eighth grade graduate, and I'm speaking on behalf of my parents. My parents and I believe that during this current situation, it would be best to take precautions and limit the risk by having online classes, especially considering that in this current situation, more people will be vulnerable to be infected by COVID-19, which currently has no vaccine for protection and adding to the fact that some people have had or have health conditions considering the fact that I am the ex-cancer patient. We also question how any student, teacher, or staff member can wear a mask for a pro prolonged period without their heart and lungs not being negatively affected. Thank you for your time. Okay, I'm just looking for our next speaker now. Salida Malik, you have the floor. Salida Malik. Uh, hello. Hi, yes, we hear you. You have the floor, thank you. Hi, um, I'm an older sibling of students who attend all levels of Prince William County Schools. Um, education has grown stagnant, but reopening schools will not resolve this. Like many have mentioned, the 50% model includes complex maneuvering between different groups of students, constant cleaning, and a lack of diverse teaching options. In order to keep everyone as safe as possible, three feet apart, avoiding any contact, classes will have to be taught in long lecture style slots ranging from 45 minutes to hours that most students, even at the high school level, can't sit still for. Uh, elementary and middle school students can't be expected to adequately learn anything if most of the time is spent telling them to keep their hands to themselves, keep their masks on, sanitize, cover their cough, and stare straight ahead, not interact with their friends, and watch the teacher present from a safe distance away. Ask any teacher how long they can give a middle school student a worksheet and expect them to sit in the same spot for hours to complete, complete it. Education is highly interactive. Students are used to doing various activities with their peers and teachers, and this will not be possible in the middle of this pandemic. Yes, virtual classrooms are not ideal by a long shot, but compared to the rigid high-stress environment of the 50% model, virtual learning, if provided equitably, is the safest option, as well as the best education option in this moment. Anyone who believes in school learning right now will look anything like before or wearing rose-colored glasses, because that's not gonna be the case. I understand that families can opt into virtual only, but that's not enough. Putting teachers in a high-risk environment um, is not okay. Parents who may be on the fence should not feel inclined to have their children attend in person because of a false sense of security. The plans sound great in theory, but are not feasible for real-life implementation. Who's gonna stop kids from fighting, you know, from couples making out? Like, this happens all the time. Um, who's gonna make sure that kids are sitting far apart in buses, that they're not touching the railing when they're walking in? Already buses are rowdy. Bus drivers, what, are they gonna stop? and? It's just not feasible. Like the plans sound great, but it just won't work right now. And it doesn't make sense to rush into opening schools when we can just take some more months to figure out better options. Right now, virtual only is the safest way to go. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Jesse. Mr. Jesse, you can unmute your microphone. Yes. Yes, I'm Richard Jesse, live in Occupy District. As a Marine, I served three corps in Vietnam. The leaders of this country ordered us into the war, and I had no issue serving because I volunteered to risk my life to defend the, this country. There are some of you listening tonight that protested against the decision by our leaders, and you felt that our government had no right to put me and others at risk. However, it was my decision, and I knew what I signed up to do. This is not the case for the custodians, the cafeteria workers, the secretaries, the bookkeepers, the bus drivers, the nurses, the teachers, et cetera. 
they did not sign a contract or volunteer to be placed in a situation where they could die for your child. They did not agree to be exposed to the virus and accidentally take it home to their family or lose their job if they refuse to do so. Yes, we want our kids back in school, but you don't have the right to insist that they do so at the expense of others and force others to face death or cause death of their loved ones. Yes, you, some of you will lose your jobs or your business, but do you have the right to say to the school staff, you must take care of my kids and risk your health so I may save my job or my business. Most of you know that a significant percent of high school students do not follow the safety rules to prevent the spread of COVID. They have been socializing, sneaking out at night, going to the beaches, and have no intention of being safe when they get into school. Some of you and your students are making plans to party over the Labor Day weekend. What might happen to our schools by the end of week two or three? I request that we consider the 100% virtual uh, learning model and that uh, we keep that for at least the first marking period. And then we look at uh, month to month to see where we are. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, that was our last speaker. I went back through the list to see the speakers that we missed and um, none of them are present. So that is our last virtual speaker. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Thank you for all the work you and our IT staff have done to set this, um, I think, very successful beginning to our first hybrid meeting. So thank you all very much. And I convey that thanks from the board and the staff. Um, at this point, the school board will take a recess for 25 minutes. We will return at what is that, 9, 9.20? 20 minutes, 20 minute, 20 minute recess. So we'll make it about 9.15. I was doing the math wrong. 9.15. So Mr. Stevens, put up on the screen, return in 9.15, thank you. The Prince William County School Board will return to open session after its recess. We are now ready for superintendent's time. Dr. Stephen Walt, superintendent. Thank you so much, Chairman Latif and members of the board. Tonight, unlike last week, it is a, a much more brief presentation. A number of these items uh, will look familiar to you. There's no big shocking new information. And uh, the slides are, uh, I believe, 16. So I'll move quickly through those. At our work session last Wednesday, there was a consensus, unanimous consensus at that time to look at the 50% model of bringing uh, basically half of our students back uh, two days a week and then the other half, the other two days with a Monday being a virtual day and so the presentation is based on where we left off last Wednesday. That being said, let me start off by saying I recognize that things can change, so this is simply based on the direction that you gave me at the end of last Wednesday's meeting. Uh, next slide, please. So I presented four different models. Plan one was an all virtual. Plan two brought 25% of our students back, and they would come back one day a week, 25% each of four days. And that was what was fully aligned with the CDC, VDH, and Virginia Department of Education. Plan three is the 50% model. It's circled because that's where you landed at least uh, a week ago. And plan four is uh, the everyone attend, and again, I explained that that was not a viable alternative because it did not meet the Virginia Department of Health requirements or VDOE. Next slide, please. Again, these show our guiding principles. The only uh, new ones here are number six. And again, I've talked about that with the 50% model where you landed at the end of the meeting and with the start date for students, September 8th. 
And then uh, number seven is again the unfunded mandate. So you've heard a few comments about that. I wanna explain where basically where that came from. So again, as I shared last week, the American Association of School Administrators did an analysis of everything from technology to PPE, uh, all kinds of things that are affected by COVID, and they did an average school system in America. There are about 16,000 school systems, so it was a school system of over 3,000 students. Uh, we are the 15th or 16th largest school system in America out of that 16,000. So extrapolating that out, if we use that model, it would be an additional 40 plus million dollars. So that's, that's where that came from. Next slide, please. So the 15% model that you received uh, or that you had the consensus on last week prioritizes in-person learning, mitigates the health risk to the extent possible, and again, the Virginia Department of Health requirements uh, have to be considered, and again, you're going from the lowest risk, which is all virtual, to the highest, which is all in-person. So um, with the more risk, you have this uh, smaller in-person classes, groups of students stay together uh, with the same teacher throughout. Um, it's, it's more risk than virtual. You have to stay six feet apart or to the extent possible. We have now the American Pediatrics Association that talks about possibly uh, three feet Number four, this model allows flexibility to revert to an all virtual house or to return to normal, either way, if ordered by the governor. Next slide, please. So again, the alignment to the 50% model, as I just mentioned, there would be some times uh, that there would be three feet of physical distance possible and monitored. Face coverings would need to be worn any time it was within or less than six feet of social distancing if that's not possible. All staff and students must wear face coverings the majority of the day, including on school buses, unless it's six feet or more. There would be daily self-screenings of symptoms for both staff and students. We would have a revised code of conduct uh, I'll just save you a lot of questions for tonight. We're not prepared to answer questions because VDOE has not given their revisions to us yet. We must align with VDOE, and they're telling us now it will be the end of July. But it, it will include things like, how do you handle someone who refuses to wear a face covering? Number six, employees will certify when logging into their network or our timekeeping system, which is all automated, that they have um, done their self-screening. A minimum of three feet of physical distance. We are able to confirm that we're going to be able uh, to do that. We're going to have a few challenges, um, but many of them will be three feet, so they'll be uh, wearing the mask, or wearing the face coverings. I wanna make sure I am clear, face coverings. And then, we, to the extent possible, are going to try to feed the kids in the classroom so we don't have all the mixing and movement. However, there may be some variance on that. For example, if there's a large space in a high school, if the cafeteria, um, where we have so many lunch shifts, we would still organize those with uh, six feet apart because obviously you have to remove your face covering to eat. But there might be schools, if it's not using the space for something else may be able to use at least part of a lunchroom, but many, many uh, students will just eat in their classes. Next slide, please. So again, this is just a little information about the work plan, the return to work plan. Um, I think the only thing that I would mention uh, on number one, those benefits provide for 10 work days. And uh, number four, 
uh, I just wanted to call to your attention, we still have state classroom caps. So some, someone mentioned uh, the other last Wednesday that, you know, well, perhaps we could do the uh, in-person and then maybe have another 50 or 60 students online. Regardless of whether it's in-person or online, we have to adhere to the state uh, caps for number of students per teacher. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, we've been over number one. Number two is just a reminder that as of right now, we're in the process of administering a survey to see what parents might want to opt out and do a total in-person versus uh, total online. So opting out of in-person onto online. And those decisions will be needed by July 24th. If a parent does not respond, that will be considered a uh, default to in-person for our planning purposes. And then we would ask parents to make that decision for one semester. Four, we've been over many times. Uh, the reason we went to Monday on the all virtual day for students and teachers is to align with other major school systems where we tra have a lot of trade-offs between students and parents who cross districts uh, where they may live here and work someplace else. Uh, so they may live, uh, they may have their family here, but they may work in Fairfax or Loudoun. We worked, it took several weeks to get us to uh, land on that. I also wanna reassure everyone that I've been uh, reassured myself that the deep cleaning that people talk about, well, maybe we should have that on Wednesday. Uh, I've been uh, reassured, and again, we had uh, Mr. Shiroki talk about that. We can do a deep cleaning, and we'll be doing a deep cleaning five nights a week in every building, every classroom. On Mondays, uh, we talked about that. Again, it's planning time, professional development, and virtual office hours for students. That also may include some mental health counseling, uh, so those options are there for the Mondays. Uh, number seven, for people who have the in-person, we will have recorded and or live virtual support provided uh, similar to virtual Virginia and virtual Prince William. There were some questions around why can't we do even more like Zoom classrooms where simultaneous to in-person instruction, uh, we can be Zooming to the students who are at home. We can do that on a limited basis. However, we do not have the technology capacity to do that in a very big sense across the entire district. And then number eight, all students will use Canvas course content including in-person and those who opt out of the in-person. Next slide, please. So we put this graphic together and uh, that's been available in our frequently answered questions. I'm not gonna go all the way through that, but there were a lot of questions that this graphic speaks to about, well, what's gonna make this different than when we had the pandemic optional learning in the spring? Um, and I, I would just start off by saying, a number one is we were not allowed to have new instruction. That was, was a huge change. We, don't have, we didn't have our common platforms in place that we have now, but this actually gives you a checklist of the things that will be improved uh, that you can take a look at at your leisure, and of course this will be posted to the web uh, through our frequently asked questions. It's already posted. Next slide, please. So this is a video, um, well, I can't remember which board member, it may have been more than one suggested, uh, you know, could you give us a testimonial because some of you had heard some positive things about the way our virtual instruction changed uh, even since the spring. And so I would like to share, this is a brief video, this is a teacher using Canvas, and uh, he's a teacher at Hampton Middle School this summer. This was a part of our 21st century grant uh, that 
Hampton uh, was able to get and has used for several years, but this obviously is the first year that it was virtual. And this is uh, Mr. Marvin uh, Villanova, who is going to share about a two-minute dialogue. Would you roll the video, please? We're not getting the sound, guys. Sorry, let's try from the beginning. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. I am Mr. Villanueva. I was one of the teachers who participated in the virtual summer school offered by Hampton Middle School to our rising sixth graders. So during our summer school, we use Canvas and Zoom hand in hand. For me personally, Canvas serves as a guide for me to plan what will be my lesson for that particular day. Also, all that you need, you can put everything in just one location. You just have to plan on how you're going to arrange them so that the flow of your class will run as smooth as possible and you can maximize the time that you have for your students so that you can teach them the objective. If I'm going to provide them some uh, assessment, for example, I can tell if a student already logged in and started taking that particular assessment. And after the student is done taking the assessment, you can right away see the, uh, the result, including the uh, mistake or the items that a student missed. The result will provide feedback for you if the student understood the lesson or not. Canvas also supports integration of a different application. So in my case, I've been using exam view and all the questions that I created in my exam view banks, I can easily import those questions and put it in Canvas. The modules that we have in Canvas can also serve as an agenda for the students. So all in all, Canvas is like a one-stop shop. Everything that you need, you can put it in Canvas. The student just go log in and everything that they need will be in front of them. It will make the learning process for students run smoother. So having everything in one place makes the learning and teaching experience run better. As long as the modules are prepared ahead of time, teachers and students will not have to worry where to find the resources that they need. We can optimize learning and the end result will be we can minimize all those frustrations and at the same time improve the learning experience of all stakeholders. So thank you, Mr. Villanova. Next slide, please. This is another familiar graphic that's on the frequently asked questions and we went through that again uh, last week, but that just essentially shows um, the top bar across where you have the alternating colors. Um, you show that the, there are no students in the building on Monday, and then you have students going uh, in houses. House A would be Tuesday and Thursday, House C would be Wednesday and Friday, and then as we mentioned, we would have certain students, uh, certain special needs students with uh, IEPs that require more on uh, indirect person support uh, would be going every day and some of our second language learners. That's why you see house B there four times across there. And then if you go down below uh, to the second grouping, you see what happens with students who are doing the at-home learning. Again, this is not new, but I just wanna remind people that that's on our frequently asked questions and there was uh, more than many people requesting, well, you know, have you actually thought about how this looks? And the answer is yes, and that gives you a sense. Next slide, please. So similarly, people wanted to know, well, what is this like, what is a schedule perhaps look like? These are not schedules that are set in stone, but this gives you an example of uh, some of our work task force teams of teachers, uh, administrators, support staff, and central office employees 
uh, that give you a sense of the minutes that we laid out last week. And again, that graphic is available online. Next slide, please. So on this slide, again, you see that this is posted to frequently asked questions. And this shows you, again, um, some of the things that are going to be happening with the distance home learning schedule. And then at the bottom, there were a number of people who talked about the concerns of uh, recommended overuse of uh, being online or in, in front of a device. So uh, that shows the screen time. Uh, based on uh, the research that's available. Next slide. Before I talk about this one for a moment, let me just say that these are, again, are not set in stone. So these would be fluid and, and might change somewhat. And of course, bus schedules would change the times, the start times, the end times. As everybody knows, we have a very complex bus scheduling plan. And so not everybody gets to school at the same time, but this was a realistic snapshot that showed you not only the schedule, uh, but also shows you uh, the lunch times worked in there. And this particular one on slide 13 is the middle school return to learning. Uh, we have some schools on a seven period schedule and some on a six, so that gives you a snapshot of each. And again, our task force work groups uh, put these together, and uh, that uh, included many teachers. Next slide, please. This is the high school model. And uh, again, this gives you a snapshot of what would happen. As I mentioned in a previous slide, uh, there's the, the times, and then you have the Monday as the out of school time and what people would be doing, and then Tuesday, Thursday and Wednesday, Friday, with the periods and then the lunch shifts. Next slide. Someone asked to see, well, you know, there's a lot of questions about the bus transportation. So originally, it, the guidance came out, and it was like very strict. You're only going to be able to get like 11 kids uh, on a 73 to 77 passenger bus, and maybe 12 with the driver's child. And then the guidelines changed, and they said, you know, you could do some mitigation. It's higher risk. But if you put a child on each seat and they were wearing their mask, and then for elementary students, uh, most of our buses have, well, our buses have higher seats. So there's also some additional mitigation for elementary students just by virtue of the height of the seats. And again, families. Uh, who have multiple kids on the same bus can sit together. Next slide, please. The main thing I would like to mention uh, on this slide, we have the first day of school, uh, September 8th. But one other thing I would like to mention just as a wrap up is in order to, to get schedules in place, it, it is a massive scheduling undertaking. Um, and to figure out what teachers are going to be teaching virtually and which teachers are going to be in person and which teachers are going to do a combination. It is critically important to know how we're going to open school tonight. So please understand that we need a decision tonight. In the absence of a decision tonight, there's no way we can get all this in place by September 8th, so we're going to be looking at an additional delay unless we have that decision tonight. So with that, that concludes kind of an overview of, of where we left off and some of the things that you asked me to clarify for tonight. Chairman Lateef, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Waltz. I think uh, I would reserve questions for the superintendent as we work through the motions this evening. So he did make his presentation. Much of the presentation was um, slight updated from the work session last week where we spent a uh, uh, considerable amount of time questioning that. So at this time, we'll move to 12.01, and a motion is in order. Mr. Wilk? Mr. Chairman, I move that in order to reopen schools this fall while protecting the health, safety, and well-being of students and staff, the Prince William School Board adopt the following 
One, the proposed return to learning plan, specifically the hybrid combined 50% capacity in-person and distance learning model with optional 100% virtual participation and authorize the superintendent to implement any additional mitigation measures as are appropriate to accommodate the model and also to adopt the superintendent's proposed return to work and health plans and a modification to the school board cal calendar to change the return to school start date for students to September 8, 2020. Do I have a second for Mr. Wilk's motion? I, Ms. Wall? Uh, I'll second the motion. Ms. Wall seconds the motion. Um, we'll open the floor for discussion. Um, I'll start with Mr. Wilk, since you made the motion, sir. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I want to thank all parents, students, and teachers who have expressed their thoughts, feelings on the return to learn plan for this upcoming school year. I want you all to know that I've listened to you intently and that you have been heard. This includes answering as many emails as possible to anyone who's identified themselves from the Potomac District, taught in the Potomac District, or had a student attending in the Potomac District. This also includes being one of only four board members to host a virtual student town hall with my colleague, Ms. Wall, for student input. Please let me start by saying that I'm not opposed to 100% virtual start for the school year if the data supports that requirement to be able to safely return to new learning in Prince William County. However, at this point in time, I also strongly feel that it is too early to give up planning for a personal in-person option. We have states reopening in early August all across the country. As many of you know, with my job, it has provided me a vast network of superintendents all across this country. I know many of these superintendents are opening school at the beginning of August, and I want to learn from them. Over the next few weeks, we, have a, we will have an increasing body of data regarding the opening of school that we can use to make the best decision possible, which is why I'm advocating we revisit our return to learning plan on a special board meeting on August 12th, if the chair and group will permit if this is passed. I'm aware that some districts have already announced an all virtual opening. I can list just as many, if not more, in the Commonwealth of Virginia who are moving forward with a blended in-person option. Even those who are moving forward with all virtual are making the critical decision to uh, provide accommodations for in-person certain categories of special education students. Please trust me that if the data supports that an all in-person option is not safe for our students and staff, I will immediately support a change to the all virtual opening at our August 12th meeting. If that is not enough time, I will ask the board to delay the opening of school so we can collect enough evidence before we put any staff or students in the schools. I also will, if we have to move to all virtual, still support the need to provide accommodations and in-person instruction for, for certain categories of special needs students. I wanna reiterate, I will not put our students and staff in harm's way. I've been a major advocate for our teachers over my five years on this board. I can list the many initiatives that I've helped lead to help improve their lives, including being one of the leading chargers for supporting the COLA. Thank you, Ms. Jesse, for supporting me with that. Four years ago, I was the only board member remaining along with the former chairman who voted to unfreeze the back steps for our teachers. I believe the division needs to prepare for both options. There is no reason why this can't happen as we wait for revised CDC guidelines and the actual data and case studies on what occurs in states starting to open in early August. I would also again be willing to push back the start date to analyze what is occurring as a result of in-person instruction. I also believe it is important that we continue plans for the 50-50 in-person option and all virtual opening at this time. In the event that we need to proceed with an all virtual opening, the planning for the 50-50 in-person option will eventually be vital as we plan on going forward and phase in in-person instruction as conditions would permit. In summary, it is not a waste to plan for this time. Our ultimate goal is to put our students in school even if this is voted down tonight. I appreciate the many voices and input from my community. I understand, as I've stated, in emails, on social media, with my views, that this is not going to satisfy all my constituents with this vote. To the families that I represent, please know that I will always have the safety and well-being of students at heart. And to our teachers and staff members, please know I have always led the charge to help our educators, starting from the onset of my term, 
when I led the charge to overturn the extended contract passed by the previous board. This decision directs, it directly impacts many of us personally. I have two sons who will be attending school this fall and a spouse who has taught 15 years in this county. As a board, we have received hundreds of emails and although many may not be happy with this vote, I can assure you that my ultimate intention is to look out for the students and teachers of this county. Again, because I know the media works with sound bites, I would just like to plan for both options and reevaluate our plans in August should COVID-19 shut down school districts across the country. If the fears expressed by a number of members of our staff, staff and constituents do occur, we will see this unfold throughout the country and I will vote to immediately go all virtual before any teacher or student steps in a building in this county. Our plan must remain fluid and be constantly reevaluated based on all indicators mentioned above. Again, no student or teacher will ever enter school under my view with this idea and plan because if necessary up to September 5th, we will keep on reviewing and analyzing the data before any person steps in a school. I will ask the board to again at that point extend the start time for whatever reason if we do not have adequate information. I am not pro-student or teacher death as many people including former colleagues and friends have accused me of over the past couple of days because my view has been public for the last week. I just at this time feel we should move forward looking at both options until we know more. Thank you. I'll just go to Ms. Wall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to begin by uh, thanking. Speak, speak into oh, the mic a little sorry. bit closer. That's fine. And everyone will hear better. I want to thank the superintendent and staff for all of their hard work um, on um, following our directive that we gave last week um, to look more into the 50% model, the hybrid model. Um, at that time, it seemed like that was there was a lot of consensus. Um, obviously, on the board, we we told you that. So I really appreciate that all the hard work that went into that. One of the benefits of that hard work is that we really took a deep dive into all of the health mitigation um, aspects and really thought about it. And, and the community and teachers and others were able to give us a lot of thoughtful questions. Um, and we gained a better understanding of how teachers and others are feeling about this model. So I appreciate um, the process. I honor the process. I feel like it's important to have those tough discuss dis discussions um, and really um, pursue all of our options uh, really thoroughly. So um, with the realities of the pandemic, um, making the return to school um, so stressful for so many, I wish to just say I know it's a challenging time. We, um, we have a lot in common. We are all scared. Um, and we are all trying to do the best thing that we can. Um, keeping in mind that the purpose of what we do is to educate children and, and they need us. So um, I, have, I just wanna speak to the merits of the 50% plan at this time. I understand every plan has merits and um, challenges. So one of the greatest merits of the 50% hybrid plan is that it gives parents a choice. For those parents who desperately need teachers to help them support their children, it gives them that option, at least two days a week, and for some children, four days a week. Um, it acknowledges that need um, and uh, gives that flexibility. The second general merit that I see with this plan is that it acknowledges that not every child is going to be able to learn optimally in an online environment. We know that there are different kinds of learners, different students have different needs. Some are very tactile, they need that human interaction. Um, and this, this plan does acknowledge that and prioritize it. In particular, we have those children that we need to watch out for who do not have proper parental support at home. Um, they're on their own a lot of times and maybe parent, parents are working, can't help, parents don't um, have the capabilities, the language skills, whatever it is, um, to help out their children. And teachers, I've always filled in that special need of being that second parent for those children, in a, in a sense, because they care about kids in that, in that way. They love them. Um, a second advantage of this plan is that for those for whom in person um, is hands-on or ideal programs like um, welding or cosmetology or um, science programs where you need labs and things like that. Music students who need to be able to play an instrument can't do that over Zoom. Um, 
you know, things like that, the, the things that kids really care about, the clubs or the activities. We can all be wearing masks and we can be wearing, you know, keeping apart from each other. We can still do some of those activities, the things that kids love, the things that make them keep coming to school because it, they find their passion. This plan honors that. This plan honors the special education priorities of many students who need much more instruction and hands-on involvement um, that is possible through a virtual environment, but not as ideal. Um, it prioritizes English language learners, especially our level ones and level twos, who cannot hear English in their home because nobody speaks it. So we have an opportunity, we have a responsibility to not widen the gap for those children, but to keep them learning. And, and in-person does give a lot of support for that, although I recognize that virtual can do that as well. Um, kids um, who don't have adults in their life who care about them, kids who are susceptible to abuse and neglect and abandonment and other problems. This hybrid model acknowledges that we have children in those categories as well. That's another one, one of the reasons why I, one of the strengths of this hybrid model is that we can advocate and care for those children and get them the help that they need. Um, additional strength is that we, um, we can meet children's social and emotional needs. They can visit with people, counselors, and others in person. You can do that online, that is true. But there's nothing to substitute for the eye contact, the, the look that says, I understand, I care. Um, I know we can, if we move to a virtual model, we can still do our very best for that, but you know, sometimes you just need a, a person next to you to um, feel their, their strength. Um, and lastly, in some areas of our county, um, in, in areas where I live, we have some challenges with technology, broadband, internet, and other problems. Um, and so um, I do foresee that if we go 100% virtual, we will have a challenge with meeting the needs of all kids um, because some kids don't have, don't have technology. It would give us some, at least some children that the opportunity to have that at use the resources that are available at school. Now, I do understand that the 50% hybrid model puts our teachers um, in the front line of um, you know, greater exposure to COVID. I'm very sensitive to that. Um, we have, um, because of what we have directed the school board to do, I mean, sorry, the, the school division to do, um, they have um, pulled out the stops and, and gone all, all, all in on trying to figure out every single possible way to mitigate the health exposure risks that come with COVID-19. Um, the question that we have to ask ourselves is that at a level that we are comfortable with as a society to our community and specifically to our teachers. And I know that teachers have um, expressed loud and clear their thoughts on that. I appreciate that, I acknowledge that, I understand that. Um, but uh, the health plan is extensive and there are many built-in protocols and um, layers of protection. It's very robust, it's very thoughtful, so I have confidence that if we did go forward with this plan, we would be able to mitigate um, the, the risks to our, um, to our community and especially to our teachers. Um, so going forward, um, I, you know, speaking to the merits of the plan, I know it's not perfect. I know none of these plans are perfect, actually, um, but I, do, um, wanna, I did want to highlight those um, merits of the plan. Thank you, Ms. Wall. Any volunteers to go next, or I'll just go in order. How about we go to Ms. Zargapur then? And you can pass if you so wish as well. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Latif. Um, actually, Ms. Wall, I really love how you, you pointed out so many things in the plan um, to return it 50%. Uh, and all of those things are absolutely true. Um, my reservations right now are, are more about do we have enough time to actually be able to implement those things? I am very worried about um, that timeline. I, I think, I believe that no matter what, teachers, staff in these buildings will do anything to make the schools ready. But I am very worried about how many of our students will be in the buildings. I'm worried about the crush of time, especially for high school. It was explained to me that this whole thing relies on how the high schools are scheduled. And that's a big, big, huge deal because they need to know who's coming to the building, who decided to go virtually. And then after they decide, after they figure that part out, they have a lot of other things to do. And they can do it. I just don't want to put so much pressure on them. I'm also concerned about teachers who are worried about trying to prepare. I know they're gonna walk in their classrooms, they know what to do, but these classrooms look different. And they're very, very concerned about how are they gonna keep things cleaned. And I know these things are in place, 
but I want them super well thought out. I don't want a teacher to have to be more worried about whether they missed a spot. It just, it's, I feel like we're just not quite ready yet. It, this is a good plan for all of the reasons you said, and I absolutely agree, and it addresses the needs of so many of our students, but I think we need to work toward that. Ms. Jackson? I just want to take a moment and thank the staff um, for working so hard on this plan. It's really helped me, you know, ask questions, research over the last week, and I really appreciate the emails and the preparation made for today. But in the end, I've had to reflect on my 14 years in the classroom and the knowledge given before me, and I don't think we are ready to start the 50-50 plan as of right now, September 8th. And it is no fault of the hard work uh, that the staff at Prince William County has done. It is the fact that we are underfunded, understaffed, and overcrowded. We only get one chance of this, and as someone with unique medical needs within my family, and someone who knows personally what it's like to not feel to be able to breathe, I understand the severity of my vote. My top mission is to keep students and staff safe, and I ran on a premise that I would advocate for them. I have thought about the students with IEPs and 504 and dual language students. And as of right now, based on this plan, I do not think we could meet their needs based on best practice. I'm concerned about mass compliance within my community and three of my schools are in zip code 20109, which is ranked number four out of 93 in terms of cases per 10,000, in terms of the amount of cases per 10,000 persons in Northern Virginia. If um, I'm also concerned that it's only been six months since we've known, you know, the what this disease looks like. So we and most of that time, schools have been closed. So we're not sure how this will look long term on our students. I think if we commit ourselves to um, rolling out slowly, like taking into planning this out further, because there are many positive things to the 50-50 plan then we can also allow for parents to have a firm understanding of what childcare should look like in the fall if they know that they will have virtual learning and it's not a surprise that we have to close due to un, you know, unknown factors of COVID, they can better plan. I believe that virtual learning provides for a consistent, routine-driven, best practice-oriented approach given the information that we have right now. I'm also concerned about the funding required to open and the month for people to redo an entire master schedule when that takes half a year. And my, so based on the 14 years in the classroom and the amount of stuff that I have learned in the 14 years, in the end, I have to make a decision based on the information given and I don't support the 50-50 plan as of right now, but I do support it in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Ralston? Me? Please unmute, Ms. Ralston. Thanks. Another webinar. Go to webinar. Yeah. Mr. Stevens, can you unmute Ms. Ralston? I just sent a uh, unmute request. Got it. You should see a request that pops up, Ms. Ralston, and just accept it. Dr. Lateef, can I go? Sure. While Ms. Ralston works on her technical difficulties, we'll go with Ms. Lily Jesse. Okay. <clears throat> uh, good evening. Um, well, I'm back at the 78% of people who said, Safety was the number one concern. I have a prepared speech, but as I listen uh, tonight, I hear a lot of people talking about children and the Pediatrics Association and various people and what their views are about children's safety. I heard nobody talk about adult safety. We have one chance to get this right. If something happens to a teacher, if a teacher is infected, 
the school system is going to have to close down. I don't know what the, the governor is going to say, but I think we need to think about teachers and the adults and all the other strategies. I, I guess I'll go to my notes. I'm just, I'm very emotional about this because I've, I've received probably every minute I'm receiving an email from people. Every minute for, for the last three days. <clears throat> Similarly, those emails were sent to Dr. Waltz and his staff. And yet tonight, <clears throat> we didn't preface anything about our concerns for safety for our teachers. And I think that Dr. Waltz, you missed an opportunity to talk about what concern most of the teachers. First of all, I want to thank two groups of people. First, the voiceless that have gotten a voice to the tune of an email every two minutes. Those are teachers. Please forgive me, but I was unable to respond to the hundreds of emails. But I was so very delighted to see that you had the courage to speak out. In fact, I loved it. Many of you shared the most personal and privately held secrets with us. You told us about conditions that you have that other people don't know about. You talked about your families, your husbands, your parents, that you ones that I won't be able to go home to see my father for a year. I'm honored that you chose to share your hearts and soul with me. Second, I want to address the voiceless. These are the individuals who are going to be on the front lines of exposure, who are either afraid to share their concerns openly or felt their voices would not be heard. These are the secretaries, the cafeteria workers, the custodians, the bus drivers, the latter did send concerns with the carrier. The bus driver sent concerns to me, but asked for anonymity because they're afraid. Also included the students, and I want to thank Chloe Presley, Tessa, Tessa Brown, who created the hashtag PWC Student Voice Instagram for students, and of course, Ben Kim, who did the survey. They were featured on ABC News tonight. This is the most meaningful an impact, impactful decision I've made as a board member. I'm so honored to serve and actually love being able to go into battle, to be honest with you. My philosophy has always been when you go into battle, you go into win. And I hope that happens for me tonight. Many of you said this is a tough decision. No, it's not. It's the decision to put Put or not put teachers and staff and it's the decision not to put teachers, staff, and members in harm's way. It's really, um, it's a no-brainer. It's a decision that comes with a very central mantra that I've heard through these 200 emails or so, I don't know how many. Today, I just could not keep up with them. This was a mantra that I heard that I didn't see in the slide presentations. This was a mantra. Number one, we're scared. Two, we need our jobs, but we don't want to sacrifice our health. We need protective gear, and it should not be optional. We love our students, but know that they cannot fully enforce the distancing and mitigation strategy without additional support. In other words, don't ask us to be teachers and healthcare safety monitors when there's a lack of, the, the lack of enforcement could result in deadly consequences. We do not want to be responsible for passing the virus to our students, nor do we want to contract the virus and pass it on to our personal family members. Don't expect us to be silent when decisions have been have such dire consequences as are shown to us at the and, and, and it's shown to us at the last minute. 
you gave us more time. I'm speaking for teachers. And Justin, you know, we talk about budget and all these things, but you gave us more time to advocate for our raises than you gave us to advocate for our home safety. Again, I say, Dr. Waltz, I, I know those people up there that work with you. Some of them are very close to me and very personal, and it's very difficult for me to say what I have to say. But I see it as a missed opportunity to show how I feel, staff, how much we care about them. The most concern, I was most concerned about personnel. There are very little, a few people that were teachers on personnel. And all most of the questions that came to us were about personnel. They weren't about whether or not it's going to be asynchronous or synchronous. Teachers are going to do whatever we ask them to do. It's not about that. They're saying, look, please think about us. Think about who you're asking to do this. Then there, were, uh, there was a committee. No, I saw no people like bus drivers, cafeteria workers. I saw none of those people. Those are the people who are going to be on the front line. They're, they're going to be on the front line. We're going to vote to go with a model that we may not have enough money to buy money. We're about whether or not it's going to be a and Mr. Stevens, there's some background. Someone needs is needs to be muted. Make sure everyone's muted, please. Okay, you were told at the last meeting the number one concern was safety. Yet we received another PowerPoint presentation as in, you were addressing instructional delivery. Your PowerPoint became powerless. It did not state that up front. <clears throat> Yeah, we care about you. We're concerned about you. I do not support opening schools with in-school participation in since September. I do support virtual a virtual model, perhaps the first nine weeks. The 50-50 plan, God knows I've looked at it, and you guys have put a lot of work into it, and it's a good model. But I think we need to go slow and take it slow and start with that a virtual model. We need to see where Prince William is after those people take that risky vacation trip after Labor Day. I'm concerned about the PPE for teachers. To me, they're essential workers. You wouldn't ask a nurse to bring her mask. You wouldn't ask her to provide her own equipment. Yet, this is not the same teaching situation we've had before people. We're asking people to go into a possibly toxic situation. Now, I did ask today about the budget. And I learned, thank you, Mr. Wallaford, that you have $17 million for deferred projects and $5.8 million in our general reserve. Perhaps, you know, it's like, we're site-based, or what's so principals are not going to get their budget until September 30th. They don't know how much money they're going to get. So some schools may get PPE, other schools may not get PPE. It should be a top-down decision. It should be a no-brainer that everyone would get adequate PPE from the top. I don't know how we do it, but we need to do it. Maybe by waiting nine weeks and doing virtual, we'll know, we'll know more about this virus. Principals will have a better sense of what their enrollment is going to be, what their budgets are going to be. You will have more time, Dr. Waltz. I heard you say, we got to have this by this. We got to have, we can't do something one, two, three, four, five when we're talking about putting people in a toxic situation to parents. 
I understand. Uh, I was in a Title I school, and I know that babysitting is a problem. To people in middle class America, if you're like me, we both have to work. Nice house, but we both have to work. I understand that. But I don't think I got, I received email from parents saying, look, I know it's going to be a problem, but I would not want to put teachers or staff or bus drivers or custodians in harm's way. I'm sorry if I'm very emotional about this, but um, we have to listen to what people say is important. They'll do that model. You know, they'll learn all that stuff. They'll go for professional development. I know teachers, they'll learn. But they're saying, look, stop. I don't think I can take any more emails on my uh, computer anymore. I've never seen this kind of flow of people being concerned. And I think we have to listen to them. Thank you very much. Would you please, tech people, put up slide three, the second slide? <clears throat> Guiding principles. Yes, the second slide of Dr. Walt's uh, presentation. Yeah. Yes. Ms. Jesse, that thank you. Slide. I'm going to move on to Ms. Ralston. Dr. Waltz, I'll, I'll have you at, at the end of the discussion and during the motion. But Ms. Ralston. I want people to see the slide. Got it. Ms. Ralston. I, I thought we unmuted it. You're good. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an educator. Uh, never been an educator. I've worked in schools for a few years. I think it was like 10 or 15. And it wasn't for any other purpose but to bring people to the school district so that they would understand what things are going on and why, and why things are done the way they are. I don't know too much about, wait a minute, this is in the way. Um, I don't know too much about the actual workings that you do all the time. So I say, bless you. I know that people have been calling me they actually like this new system, the 50-50. They like that. And I'd like to give them things that not only do they like, but that works for us. I think it would be a much, be I think it'd be much better. I, I don't know what else to tell you or what else to say. I'm not a good preacher. So the thing that I look forward to is how do we get people from one point to the next? Good, good words. How do you get them there? How much does it cost to get them there? Um, I, I'm not going to talk a long time because some of this is just not. I, I know that everybody wants these, th these things to be good, all of these activities. And if these, these kids are fabulous people. So you go ahead, take care of all those little bitty things, then you can always get the bigger things, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. I'm finished. Thank you, Ms. Ralston. Ben, I'm going to give you a couple minutes. You did a survey of students. If you can summarize in a couple of minutes your sort of broad findings. Thank you. Um, so I did a survey. Uh, I just like I sent it among a lot of students, and we got uh, 2,490 student responses. I looked through, try to, um, I had them put in their Prince William County email to kind of like confirm that they're students. So I had to look through a bunch of that. Um, I sent the board kind of like a summary of our findings. Um, so essentially, I think the biggest thing to note is that. Uh, 70 per when asked, quote, which option would you choose for the 2020-21 school year, 72% um, of the, the 2,490 students said uh, that they would choose the hybrid option, and then 28% would choose the full virtual option. 
uh, we uh, ask for a lot of justification, and students have, uh, they all have some very good answers and reasons for um, why they're choosing uh, what they want to choose. Um, um, just going through, we got good, uh, it was a good sample, I think, from each of the high schools, even though uh, online surveys do, do have their limitations. Um, so an important point, so I did some like cross analysis amongst the responses, and you know, it, there's like no trend among students, uh, among like age groups or, uh, or schools, you know, or what type of school it is. Um, it's all pretty consistent in how students are feeling, so that's just an important thing to note. Um, there's just some, uh, some questions that were raised by students. Um, may, I think a big one is like, how are like grading be just like how will the grading system and academic standards be like equal from virtual uh, to the in-person students because like there's arguments on both sides that like well the in-person students will have like more of a relationship with the teacher but then there's also argument that, well knowing high school students and being one when you test online kids are gonna cheat um, unlike an in-person so there's like I've gotten a lot of responses about that and having that so that's just something to figure out. Um, another question that I that got a lot on this was about governor school. Like the governor school students, um, they're very smart kids. Uh, so they just wanna know um, how, how it's gonna go down for them after we figure this all out. And um, yeah, this is a lot of students, like I, I keep telling them to like, um, that we don't, we're not sure right now, but you know, our principal and kind of students were really passionate about like the extracurriculars that we do. So a lot of these like artists and these musicians and playing music and stuff, uh, I've got a lot, a lot of stuff about that. A lot of my friends are athletes and they're looking to get college scholarships uh, for sports. So I've, I've gotten, that's the stuff I've gotten the most questions about. And I saw today the VHSL, um, the option is that football is not gonna be in the fall this year. So um, I'm that, we can't control that, but that's just something that's just in the survey because I'm just reporting what I see. Um, not gonna go over everything in it, but some takeaway points um, that most of the students want to go hybrid model. They're, um, they, they feel pretty strongly on both sides. Um, they're actually, they're informed about what's going on and uh, yeah. I know I'm missing some stuff there. If you guys have any well, questions. Well, I mean, I, I think I want to thank Ben Kim, our student, who sent us a 16-page document, I think, this afternoon around 3 o'clock with the summary of his results. If, if after you've completed the final report, and I don't know if that can be made public through the Student Senate or you all as you wish, but it, it was a lot of work that had gone into it. Um, I mean, he looked at the sample size, he studied the reliability of it, so I thought it was very well done. So I appreciate that, Ben, thank you. No, thank you. Um, it is really good to have you on this board. Um, so I, I, I reserve my comments for the last. I think it's important that, um, oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Williams. Ms. Williams, Vice Chair Ms. Williams. Thank I, you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I think on that occasion, social distancing is working in your favor because I probably would have right. kicked, right. kicked you right there. Right. Um, so, first I wanna say, um, I have never been prouder to serve on this board with the example set by our student representative. Um, there's, there's so many things about being on this board um, that are extraordinary, but watching the student representative position grow and um, the way each new student comes in and really takes the reins, is, I mean, I, I don't have a large enough vocabulary to, ex, to explain how much joy and hope you bring um, to me personally, but not only to me, but living example and proof of what, we, what students can do when we give them a voice and the power to use it. So I just wanna thank you, Mr. Kim, and the Student Senate, because um, Ms. Zabkar and I, Ms. Zagapur and I heard from so many students, but also future student representatives on the Senate, and I just feel that that's so powerful and really deserves its own set of recognition um, because often what we hear most um, from students is that they feel they don't have a voice and decisions are often made for them without any sort of acknowledgement. So thank you, Mr. Kim. I, I, I think that's fantastic. And I know you work so collaboratively with the Student Senate and the other two representatives, um, and they also deserve acknowledgement. But 
Let me tell you, I've never seen anyone break down a survey like that. I mean, we had graph for the public. We had graphs. There was colors. There were like, I mean, everything short of like a, a glossary in the back. It was fantastic. And Mr. Kim's not even in school right now, so that just goes <laughs> to show you that our students are awesome and amazing, and the variety is unmatched. So um, thank you, Mr. Kim. So on to the current motion and vote. Um, what we are facing and, 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 and how I feel is sort of that we are in a perfect storm. And, um, you know, Marion Webster defines a perfect storm as a critical or disastrous situation created by a powerful concurrence of factors. And that's where we are. There will be no decision that will make everyone 100% happy. Um, and, and there's nothing that we can do to change that. But what I can say is, in listening to everyone's comments, in reading everyone's text messages and Facebook messages and emails, and Ms. Jessie was not exaggerating, we literally were getting multiple emails sometimes per minute. And um, as someone who has sat here for seven years and continuously advocated to hear from all aspects of the community, I am very grateful. I am only sorry that I am not humanly capable of responding to each and every single one of them prior to making this vote tonight. Um, the 50-50 plan, when we started down this path, looked great, but it caused a lot of questions and it sort of became a, a placeholder of sorts. What does that mean? What does that look like? What are the realities of it? How is it going to impact our students, our staff, everyone? I don't think there's a single person who doesn't want to see their child in a building with a teacher. I really think that that is just a statement that goes across everyone, myself included. And I, I, I would love for my child to go back. I'm a parent, I, not only a board member, it, it, who, school's awesome. I happen to be a nerd, I like it. I, one of my favorite parts about being a board member is visiting schools, seeing all the amazing things that happen in our buildings and what our staff and our students are capable of doing. Having said that though, I also recognize that learning occurs in very many ways. Um, when I hear comments about the survey sample from my seat, all I can think about is the brown 30% of my district that didn't answer, that we haven't heard from since March. And it may be, that's a good sample size, as I said before, I'm not a statistician, but I'm pretty sure if I was taking a class, they'd say it was a representative sample. When I, when I think about parents and how they really feel and what questions are worded, and just the amount of people who could not understand or comprehend our, our slides on the FAQs makes me understand that there's so much more input that is needed. Um, when I think about reaching the neediest student, 50% in my district, a hybrid plan, I think about those students whose parents have been laid off and no longer have health insurance. And they, they are already black and brown students. I can g tell you for a fact, as a person of color, when I go see my medical professionals, and not my current ones, because I don't want to upset them, I have good health insurance, or what is considered to be health insurance, but I have been discriminated against. So I can only imagine what that looks like for people who are scared to go to the doctor. And I know a lot of my district students, the medical professional that they see is their school nurse or their athletic trainer. That can still be done virtually, but I can't do anything about it if I expose them to a virus and they get sick and bring it home to their entire family. Um, I need to really remind, and it cannot be stated enough, what we did in the spring was not new learning. It was not Canvas. It was out of the kindness of, the, of our staff's hearts where they reached out to, to students to continue to teach and educate and maintain a relationship. It was not mandatory. The governor said we could not teach new instruction. I can't say it enough because I repeatedly hear the spring was a disaster. The spring was an immediate reaction to what we had no choice but to do. And everyone pitched in to the best of their ability. I know I sat in my house like, what do you mean you don't know how to use Zoom? I use Zoom all the time. 
I don't understand how teachers don't know how to do this. And then I had to be like, well, that's a very privileged statement because most of my teachers are in a classroom. It's just a simple fact of life. There wasn't the need there before. We've all learned in some way, shape, or form how to FaceTime, Zoom, WebEx, Cisco, Cis you name it. None of us are, going, are experts right now. Again, it's still new for the majority of people. When we talk about Title I schools and vulnerable populations and neediest students, I think everyone has a different definition of what that is. I've seen kids who I know don't eat come in and learn and learn at home. I think when we talk about that, we have to be very careful about our lens and our framework and our privilege because most of us use items every day that were invented and designed by people who couldn't even by law learn. So I refuse to accept that my economically disadvantaged students cannot learn virtually or we cannot find a way to help them because I've seen it time and time again. And most of the things you use and you have developed are because someone didn't have something someone else did and they had to create it. So again, um, I'm a little emotional, but I'm trying to stick to factual things. When it comes to communication, now more than ever, it is critical, as one of our teachers spoke before us tonight and so eloquently put it, we need to improve our ability to communicate with parents. We continue to communicate in an outdated system that does not work for everyone, and clearly it's not reaching the people we need to reach. We continuously hear from parents and staff and members of the community who are connected. We get the same message. We are not hearing from the people whose needs are not being met repeatedly. We need to try to find alternative ways to do that. I don't know what the answer is to that, but I think now more than ever is the time to try new things, be bold and daring, and make sure we reach so that everyone truly does have a voice represented. That's the only way that we can ensure effective and equitable education for everyone. And that's not just our students, but it's our parents. It's people who don't speak English because that is still privileged to be able to speak English and communicate. Everyone can't do that. As we heard tonight from a student who called in on behalf of her parents. Um, I can't state enough that Prince William County Schools serves, and I hate this term, but a majority minority population. I am a person of color. My family are all people of color. We fall in the category of the people most affected by this virus. The children who are at the highest risk for inflammatory disease are children of color. We don't talk about that enough, but it's important. I can't do for my own family, I can't do for my constituents different than I would do for my own family and get up in the morning and look at myself in the mirror and be okay. I cannot support a 50-50 plan based upon I still have very real concerns about lunch. I have a seven-year-old. He wears a mask. He doesn't have a problem with it. But he does have a problem with, and I know he'll be embarrassed 20 years from now, but like keeping his hands out of his butt and touching his head and his ear and, you, I mean, just things seven-year-olds do. I also have a recent high school graduate, so I understand what teenagers do and preteens do. Like, I haven't been anywhere, but when you ask further, that means I only went to the grocery store, or I only went down the street to walk to meet a friend, or I only did this. We have a hard time keeping them apart on a regular day in a normal circumstance from teenage stuff. I'll just leave it there. God forbid we have to add that on top of ensuring that our desk areas are clean, how far apart your spacing is, making sure you get to a bus. I'm being a little judgy here, but teenage boys tend to be a little fighty, aggressive sometimes too. I, I don't know how we can expect our teachers to deal with that and still teach. It seems like so much. Um, the professional development and training is a key component that I still don't think we're talking about enough. 
no matter what plan we choose, I absolutely encourage it, our school division, if we command it to mandate better professional, quality professional training, not only on the tools that we are utilizing to teach and interact with our students, but on how to deal with our minority majority population students who are triple traumatized. They are going through a pandemic trauma. They are watching the nation address racism, trauma, dealing with it in their own houses, trauma. Their daily life experience before this is traumatic. It cannot be said enough. We have a high population of teachers who are not persons of color. That's not a, a good or a bad thing. It is just is what it is. If you don't give them the skills to interact with their students and recognize the trauma that they are facing, we're putting them at a deficit. Who is that really fair to? We just don't talk about it enough, but it's mandatory. It should be mandatory across all schools at all levels, not optional, not if your administrator says it's okay, not if they support it or not. You would not send anyone else into any sort of battle. You would not equip a child who has a, you would not not equip a child who has a disability without the tools that they need. So I don't understand why we're not doing that no matter what plan we choose. Um, so having said all of that, I can't support the 50-50. I discussed it with my house. I don't feel comfortable sending my child in for various reasons, so I can't ask to do the same for anybody else. So I'm not going to be supporting the 50-50 plan at this time. I think we all need a little bit more time, not only to understand the virus that is before us, but to be able to plan effectively and for the health and safety of our staff and students. While I recognize that this will have budgetary effects, um, no matter what we do, we will always have that. All I can ask when it comes to that is that the powers that be who are above us, who seem to not understand that education has always been critically underfunded, that ask for us to have our teachers and staff be essential employees but not actually designate them so, please understand that no matter what list, what we crust, what we give you, we will always need more funding. We are raising the future. It is the highest priority of the land, and there will always be a need for funding. So with that, um, I will not be supporting the 50-50. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, as I started this evening, I mentioned that this was highly emotional and highly charged, and I don't think um, anybody who's been watching hasn't seen that. Um, it is clear. I thought Mrs. Mrs. Jesse's point about the um, literally an email every minute is um, the truest statement I've heard all evening. So um, thank you, Ms. Jesse, for that. Um, I, I think you know one of the speakers spoke tonight about you know science and then the humanity. So you've heard a lot of the humanity tonight and a lot of the emotion that goes around making this decision. This is not an easy decision. Um, and I, I think you, you've all heard that and it's been very clear. Um, I was elected to guide a school system that has a $1.6 billion budget, 12,000 employees, 91,000 students. I don't think anyone, when they voted for me, said that I want you to use your gut, your instinct, your emotion to guide the school system. I think they elected me to use the best information available at the given time to make the best decision possible. I think that we should frame this discussion around, um, in this discussion, regardless of how this vote goes, will still need to be had over the course of either this evening and the rest of the school year as the health changes. But the guidance that has been provided by the organizations we choose as a society to guide us in these types of crises, like the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, the National Institutes of Health, led by uh, infectious disease experts like Anthony Fauci, 
the World Health Organization. Um, we have chosen those organizations to sift through the data to help us determine how to interpret the complex data and how it affects us on a daily basis. We have local and state health departments that interpret that data and, um, and help us decide on, on complex issues. Um, and so when the science is convenient for our view, we may say we agree with Anthony Fauci. But when the science doesn't agree with our view, we choose to say, well, we can't agree with him. I'm a physician, as many of you know, and I, you know, I'm trained in the sciences, and the science is never really always convenient. And so, but I have to abide by sort of the directives that science tells us. And the data that is presented to us must be looked at in that, that way. So the questions are that the CDC has said in phase three, school divisions may open their schools to in-person attendance provided you have mitigation to ensure safety. So I think the real question, not to simplify it, well, really to simplify it is, can we ensure the safety under phase three guidelines for in-person? And I think it comes down to that and that really alone. Because phase three says we can do it. Um, the science has said that we should start doing it. Um, and, but the question is, can we deliver that safety? And I think that's where, you know, I look at the emails from all of our teachers and staff, and they have extraordinarily legitimate points. There are really deep concerns. There were questions unanswered in our work session, questions that will be unanswered tonight, questions that will be unanswered in two weeks as we continue to get further guidelines from the state and the federal government. Well, the federal government, maybe not, but from the state, you know, we, we certainly will, will, will expect that. Um, but I think it's important that, you know, we use local health data, which is what health experts want us to do, to look at and listen for how we make our decisions. I don't, I can't make a decision on what's happening in the city of Houston. That has no bearing on what's happening here. Our numbers are going down. We've done an outstanding job in mitigating the virus. And so it is important to understand that, you know, these organizations have issued guidance. We need to decide if we can comply with that guidance and then get to work on getting a program up and running. I can attest as a physician to making, you know, as an eye doctor, not so many life and death decisions, but blind or not blind decisions. Um, and every decision I make has risk. It serves no purpose to take an exceedingly low percentage multiply by the number of kids and ask how many deaths we are willing to tolerate. We could easily do that for swimming, motor vehicle rides, and yes, even vaccinations, because vaccinations kill. We never ask ourselves before, do any of those things, and how many of those deaths, how many deaths will we tolerate from those? As health experts and physicians, we do ask those questions, but the general public doesn't typically bring that into a boardroom to discuss. We keep hearing why certain groups are at home and they're allowed to stay home to work. Why can't we stay home to work like federal government employees? And the, the question continues to come up and I think it's offensive um, when, when we send and we suggest that by sending someone into work, we believe their life is less worthful or has less worth. I think those that can work from home do the society a service because they can work from home in certain jobs and that reduces the spread of the virus and, and that makes a lot of sense. Our grocery store workers, our police and fire, our health experts, and many of the folks now as restaurants are opening and our bartenders, I mean, for God's sakes, we care how quickly we get our bars open in, the, you know, in this area, but you know, we need to care about how quickly we get our schools open as well. But, those decisions for, you know, who and how we decide doesn't determine someone's life's worth. And I, I really, I think that's important for all of us as we have this discussion, and I have emphasized over and over again, we cannot have this discussion around pitting teachers' lives versus students' education or one is worth more than the other. This has to be something we all work on together. Um, during our pandemic, the goal is to keep people who can do their work in a remote setting, and that's great. And that makes it easier for us to get our kids back. 
because people are in compliance. They're wearing their face coverings outside and doing what they do. All of that makes it easier for us to get our kids back because it reduces the rate of the infection. When a patient comes to me for a surgical procedure, we discuss the risks and benefits. Even though complications are rare, we offer a percentage. If every patient started to take that percentage and multiply it by the number of cases, it would be a tangible, real number of lives. Thankfully, no one asks us how many complications we are comfortable with. Opening schools has become a healthcare decision and the same principles apply. Asking for zero and 100% is not based on logic and will not satisfy anyone today, six months from now, or two years from now. The, vac the, the virus is with us for the long haul. If we get a vaccine, the question will, will be mandated to everybody? And if we don't, will we come in if we don't van mandate it to everyone? That's a question for society to answer. So what is the metric if in phase three we cannot open or we choose not to go live, we are going to use? I don't have a health metric. I've not heard one say a health metric that we should use. The CDC and health experts who sift through this data tell us those metrics and they've decided that this is the right time. The governor, secretary of education, VDOE, has said this is the right moment to start beginning your return to learning plans. So, you know, it is extraordinarily challenging and it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard whether we make that decision to send kids back September 8th in live person or October 8th or November 8th or January 8th. I will not be making my decision based on some arbitrary health metric that has not been vetted by our public health experts who already use the best data. I will make my decision based on our readiness to deliver what we said we would as our guiding principles, and that's health, safety, and an educational program that can deliver what we all hope it can. I've compared this crisis to trying to build a building on a fault line after an earthquake with continued aftershocks. And being asked to build that building at the same code or a better code to withstand the aftershocks so it doesn't collapse. That's what we're asked to do, our teachers, our staff. And I've never heard from a teacher who said, I can't do it. They've all said, we can do it, Dr. Latif, we want, we just need support, we need resources, we need time. I've spent the better half of the last six months asking the Board of County Supervisors for money. I've asked for it in the first round of budget when things were great. I went back, spent hours over there asking for them in the second round of budgeting. I went back a third time on behalf of this board, not I, we, uh, went back to the Board of County Supervisors after they received $41 million in CARES money and asked for more support. We did receive $9 million in CARES Act money, dedicated education, but that was it. We have real resources and real needs that we need, and I've asked them again by sending them a letter telling them what we need it for. I don't know what more to do with them, and I asked the public, who is extraordinarily concerned with what decision we make tonight and move forward, that we are still today, and no different than six months ago, among the lowest per pupil spending school system in the region. And we continue to be. If our elected leaders choose not to spend on education in a pandemic, when then can we expect them to spend on education? And that is our challenge, is to thread the needle of delivering safety within phase three with the resources we currently have and recognizing there are gonna be victims on both sides of the issue no matter how we do it. And so I don't mean to sort of go on and lecture, but I want to comment on Ben Kim's student data. That student data of, is not different than what's happening in Fairfax. Fairfax is a couple weeks ahead of us. Their data was um, closed or came in late last night, but they are 70% of the students wish to return to in-person learning at a hybrid model and 30% on a virtual. 
In an ideal world, I would love to give every student what they want virtual and, 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 and a choice, and I'd love to give every one of our faculty and staff a choice. And we may, after the numbers shake out, be able to do that, I don't know. I will support this plan knowing, as I've heard my board members and, and understanding the hours of discussion and the phone batteries that have burned out over the last two weeks, that this plan may not succeed as we vote this now, and then we're gonna take the next couple of hours or hour or a few minutes, whatever it takes to figure out a compromise, maybe, um, on how to get us there. But I am supporting this plan because no matter what, we have to get ready to go in live. So the preparations that are required for us to go in live are gonna be required to be done now, starting now, regardless of when we decide to go in live. So if we decide to go in live after the first quarter, the second quarter, or whatever, those preparations are being done now. Those surveys are gonna be sent out, we need that. So people say, why are you sending a survey today when you guys didn't vote on it? We need that data no matter what we decide. Because we are planning, I hope, to return to full in-person learning for all five days for everyone. I'll comment on one last aspect of this because I love sports and I'm a big fan, and, and, and yes, I care about the instruction, and we've gone over all that, that you know, and we have a lot more to do on that. But whatever the Virginia High School Sports League decides, I would ask this board to consider we come into full compliance with whatever the state and VHSL allows. And so as recommendations come out, and as we look to what we do in, in the future, I think that's something important because we do need to get Anyone who feels like we can get them in safely, and if we believe we can deliver it safely, sports are included. And, um, and I, I want everybody to know that. On the instructional level, this is an enormous challenge. To deliver something better than the spring at 100% virtual is gonna be very difficult. It'll still be difficult even in a 50-50 model. We have to get the virtual right no matter what. And the board knows that. We are under enormous pressure to deliver that, and the staff knows that, and they are under enormous pressure to deliver that. And if they don't deliver that, that is on all of us, and we will all be held accountable. It cannot be like the spring. It cannot be like the spring. And I understand there was no new learning in the spring, but I had real qualms about how we decide what is new learning. And that wasn't a time to have a fight because we were in the midst of a real big pandemic, but I will not... Um, um, waste a minute telling you what I believe new learning is now. And, and, and I think some of the staff knows that. Um, I will be supporting this motion to support a hybrid model on September 8th and, um, and, and, and ask the board to vote your conscience because that's what we all have to do. And then once we have this vote, we will move forward with whatever compromise or necessity we need to do. So Chairman at this point, Lateef. Yes, Dr. Waltz. Yeah, just right. uh, before you do your vote, could you pull up uh, slide three, please? I just wanted uh, to direct everyone's attention. This is the second slide tonight of number one, and that is the same number one that was on a week ago, and I spoke to it with great elaboration. Uh, it was my understanding that there was a desire for a briefer presentation, but nonetheless, I think that speaks for itself. Uh, a couple of other quick things. I just wanted to mention that the presentation was based on the 8-0 consensus and additional things that the school board asked to be presented tonight. I would also like to just clarify the fact that I did not advocate for any of the plans, nor was I asked. And finally, I uh, just wanted to give you, we have the most recent data from Fairfax, which is 7 p.m. July 15th. Uh, this is an 81% response rate of the students, and the in-person is 52% and online from students is 48%. And then the teachers, um, the in-person is 44%, and I don't have the other number, but that's the most, that's July 15th, 7 p.m. So that, that's good, that's as of the closing of the, I think the poll closed tonight, or um, today's the 15th? Yeah. Right, 
So their survey is completed tonight. So I think at this time we'll take a vote. School board members will have more time to discuss this as we move on. So please vote. I will do the roll call for those members um, away. Ms. Ralston, how do you vote? Oh, shoot. Uh, you're, on, you're on. You're good, Ms. Ralston. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I vote for the 50-50, please. Okay. Ms. Ralston votes yes on the motion B. Ms. Jackson, how do you vote? No. Ms. Jackson votes no. Ms. Jesse, how do you vote? No. Ms. Jesse votes no. What's the tally, Ms. B. Simpson? Four, the motion fails. So the final vote on that motion is four to four. A tie vote in this situation, in all situations with this board, means the motion fails. So we will not be going with that motion. Now, while we've been here talking, um, I would ask um, B if um, I sent you um, another motion that I would like to make. Um, after hearing all our board members this evening, um, after having hours of discussions with all of them, um, we've tried to, you know, I've tried in, in you know, just hearing everyone today, I'm gonna put a motion on the table and, and we can look at it and see if it's something that we can all agree to. Um, and, um, and we'll put this motion up for a, a choice because ton tonight, as Dr. Waltz pointed out, we can't leave this building unless we have a plan. So, B, do you have that motion? Can you put that up, please, for I me to read? Me. I will offer the motion and ask for a second on it. If you will give me just one moment. Do I have to refresh? What is refresh? Okay. Let, me, let me finish getting it in. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. And I want to, you know, while we're waiting for this, thank all the board members for their impassioned discussions and all the hard work they've done. This is not easy, as you can see. Um, and um, B, I don't know, you're still putting it, did, it in. It didn't come up for you. I don't know. I, I where, where am I looking for it at? You should be able to see it, John. Did it save? Okay. Um, so it's here. Uh, yeah, that's not going to show up until you put in the vote. Is it? No. Well, is it up there? Yeah. Okay. So they have to vote.